And you're going to put up the flyer, Ignacio, or? We are going live in five, four, three, two. We are live. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the monthly episode at, uh, of the University of Miami Cerebrovascular and Skull Base Surgery Symposium. Um, I remind you every third Thursday at 5 p.m. Miami time is when we're uh, broadcasting and uh, we invite you to join us. This is now session 32 of this uh, Thursday series, uh, um, and we have a fantastic panel. Uh, on endoscopic and open skull base topics. I'll introduce them very briefly at the end of this uh, brief uh, slide presentation. At the end of the four speakers, uh, our uh, cerebrovascular and skull base fellow, Nicholas Kahn, who's with us uh, this year, will present one case for the input from the panel. And that's kind of been the new format we we're doing this. Uh, uh, I'm Jacques Morcos, professor and co-chair here, University of Miami on vascular and skull base. And uh, I am always joined by my wonderful co-directors and partners, Carolina Benjamin, assistant professor in our department. She directs the Keynes Cadaveric Lab and Ca uh, Carolina specializes in brain tumor and skull base surgery. Mike Ivan, assistant professor. Mike directs uh, our research at the UM Brain Tumor Initiative and Mike is specialized in brain tumor, skull base, and epilepsy surgery, as well as Bobby Stark, who is the co-director of endovascular, particularly for the vascular sessions in, in our series. Um, uh, Mike Ivan, as you know, has had a fantastic Wednesday series uh, last year and now is doing the same thing every first Wednesday of the month. Um, and uh, has already done wonderful sessions. So we invite you to join us on April 3rd, Wednesday. And of course, I don't need to tell you who this person is, but this is of course, Ed Laws, who will talk about nuances in uh, Cushing disease. And uh, Mike, of course, is uh, directing that session. Um, for next month, for this Thursday, uh, symposium uh, i invite you to join us for a vascular session and this one will feature paul camarata david langer giuseppe lenzino and pascal jabour again it's a mixture of vascular skills 
visualization in cerebrovascular surgery and robotics uh, in endo neuroendovascular uh, discipline. Again, a very exciting panel. We try to mix it up so that it really appeals to many of you at different levels of training. And if you're interested in pediatric neurosurgery, our partners, Toba Niazi and Heather McRae, co-direct a session once a month on Mondays on uh, pediatric neurosurgery as well. So you can uh, see all of those offerings on a link I'll show you in a second. But first to thank our wonderful team that makes these uh, sessions and webinars uh, possible, particularly at the bottom right, Ignacio Escalona, who is uh, running this, the technical aspects of this session. This is the link if you want to get all this information on our departmental website and various links on Twitter, Instagram, and all the social media stuff that you're all familiar with. Um, the new format, as those of you who've been watching last year in 2020, we used to do it weekly. The new format, at least for the Thursday, is uh, alternating cerebrovascular and skull-based topic for internationally known speakers every time. I've asked them to speak for 20 minutes each, so we have plenty of time to debate or argue or discuss, and particularly to hear from you, the audience. And as you know, please write your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, the Q&A box. It's much easier for us. And uh, uh, if you look and uh, stay tuned, I have the whole year of 2021 sorted out and I'm going to put it in a few days, put all the sessions that are lined up for the remainder uh, of the year. So uh, I, last year I used to give long introductions for each of our speakers, but none of our speakers need an introduction. They all have spoken last year, so I'm not going to take any of their time that you know them all, but I'm just going to mention their name and where they're from. And of course, in the order in which they're going to speak, Paul Gardner, of course, at UPMC. Paul, uh, of course, internationally known in skull base, uh, endo and open and, and, and vascular as well. Paul is going to talk, chose for a topic, the modern paradigm for skull base tumors, combining corridors. Following that, Juan Carlos Fernandez Miranda, who of course used to be at UPMC, but now has taken Stanford by storm, as expected, uh, in his vast neuroanatomical knowledge and uh, skull base expertise. Uh, Juan is always a joy to listen to when he speaks. He's going to talk about complex craniopharyngiomas. He loves that topic, and indeed, he has fantastic uh, experience with that. Uh, he does call it a formidable challenge. He's going to talk to us about that. Third will be Aaron cohen Gadol, who is at uh, IU now, not now, has been, but apparently there is a storm, so I hope we have no technical difficulty hearing him when he's going to speak because of the iffy Wi-Fi. Aaron, of course, has uh, produced to all of you, and of course, you've all enjoyed it, the Neurosurgical Atlas, and of course, Aaron is... Uh, world expert in vascular and skull base, but he chose to, spoke, to speak about acoustic neuroma surgery. And last but not least, my good friend for many, many years, Bill Caldwell, chairman in Utah. Uh, Bill, again, I don't need to say it, past president of WNS and many other uh, distinctions, and of course, a spectacular cerebrovascular and skull base surgeon, and is fantastic educator. And Bill is gonna talk about a very interesting topic the extreme lateral transodontoid approach, the ELTO, and the stability issues with CVJ approaches. And I can already see perhaps a discussion between whether this surgery should be done endonasally or the way probably Bill is going to talk about. But that will be fun for the end of the session. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Paul Gardner to share his slides, unmute his microphone, and, and start his presentation. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Jacques. It's uh, an honor to be here again. And uh, thanks to Jacques and Carolina, Mike and, and Robert for putting this together. Always a fantastic session. I enjoy following these every, every month now. Uh, it's great to, to be on this panel with friends and also uh, people who uh, I'm looking forward very much to hearing their talks and learning from. 
I'm going to be talking about uh, what I think is the modern paradigm for skull-based tumors, which is uh, really combining different corridors, which I think all of us are starting to uh, figure out how to do. Um, these are my disclosures, which are not uh, terribly relevant uh, for this particular talk. Um, Multi-corridor surgery. Uh, uh, this is a, a slide I borrowed from Juan because it, I think, really shows it very well, is that you, we select our approach based on, ideally, on anatomic principles and anatomic principles alone. Of course, it's not that simple, but uh, this is the idea. Um, and skull-based corridors really can be uh, simplified into relatively these corridors based on neurovascular structures. Uh, of course, I'll start with the anteromedial corridor, which is the endoscopic endonasal approach, which all of us are by now quite familiar with. It gives us access to uh, the majority of the midline skull base, um, but often is, is more challenged as we extend laterally. Um, by combining this sometimes perhaps with an anterolateral approach, we can really maximize these corridors without having to do perhaps as large of an exposure with either one. A uh, uh, classic example of this is the adding the transmaxillary corridor, which is another relatively anterior corridor, but separate than uh, an endonasal. Here's a great example of a very large uh, uh, juvenile nasal angiofibroma, uh, a stage five uh, with good uh, significant carotid involvement as well, but extends all the way out here into the infratemporal and the middle fossa, which are areas, of course, we can't really access purely through an endonasal approach. Here you can see the tumor extending out uh, even up to the sphenoid wing. Uh, if we break these into uh, different parts and pieces, however, of course, after embolization, um, we can really access uh, a fair amount of it. <clears throat> we start with a transnasal mass excision after, uh, of course, doing as much uh, sinus work as possible to expose it. And here you can see, uh, after burning the tumor and also what's been relatively well embolized in this portion, here we're using a harmonic scalpel to try to split it. Uh, all kinds of devices, including the aquamontis, to, to, to burn the tumor. And then once we uh, have separated it from the rest of the mass of the skull base, we can take this large portion and move it downward. The point of treating this endonasal portion first is it gives us now the room to work within this corridor. We now uh, start to work out laterally uh, and extend here into the maxillary sinus uh, component, which is really pterygopalatine component that's pushed forward or anteriorly uh, up towards the maxillary sinus. Here's, here's working on that component. I think I've frozen this for a moment. Here we go, and, and just using, uh, again, that harmonic scalpel to separate the tumor. And here I'm taking uh, the opportunity to use the harmonic scalpel to disconnect this maxillary component from the smaller component around the middle fossa and the vidian. Uh, now working through all those corridors, and this will just show how we access those. Here's that, that masticator space in Fearley. Remember there's that one large component down to the masticator space. Again, this is using the transmaxillary corridor. We can really peel up this masticator space. You can start to see buccal fat come into view here. Uh, I'll place just patties there to hold the buccal fat back and to help it elevate. It's very important here to dissect deep to the pterygopalatine. You can see some of the nerve fibers from the pterygopalatine space. It's virtually impossible with a tumor this size to preserve the descending palatine branch, but most of these, uh, of these other branches, including branches of B3, can be completely preserved with this approach. And here you can see we're purely transmaxillary, extending down into that masticator space and peeling this, uh, this nodule of tumor upward. Uh, the nice thing about uh, JNAs is even though they can be very bloody, if you get into the right plane around them, they really deliver themselves very nicely uh, from these areas where they lobulate into. So now again, uh, transmaxillary, working through that inferior orbital fissure dissection, uh, we can extend out here into the middle fossa. The video is not cooperating very well, but here we can see V2 uh, coming up from infraorbital and we can see how the tumor really goes around the infraorbital foss, inf infraorbital uh, nerve to get, extend into the inferior uh, frame in here. And that's extending out towards the middle fossa. If we follow it carefully, understand our anatomy and understand the relationships, here you can see how that nodule can also be delivered. 
So working through this combined corridor, now, we now are just left with the portion around the orbital apex and around the cavern of sinus extending back into Meckel's cave. Again, working below and around V2. There we can look out into Meckel's cave. We've just delivered that portion of tumor from Meckel's cave. And then here is carefully uh, trimming it away from branches of, of V2. And then one of the hardest parts sometimes when we do this is delivering it. And it of course has to be delivered here trans orally. And then finally, of course, it's very important to drill out all the base of the pterygoid. There can be lots of rests of tumor from an angiofibroma, which uh, fill the, the basal sphenoid and, and the pterygoid bone. And removing all of that can ensure that we don't leave any tumor behind, even skeletonizing right up to the carotid artery. And here you can see little rests of tumor that are adherent all the way up on the vidian, all the way back to Freeman Lacera. And when we're finally done, we see just normal bone. We can see the area of Meckel's cave. And in this case, because of the middle fossa involvement, we used a contralateral nasal septal flap uh, to cover uh, that entire area of Meckel's cave in case there was some weeping from the dura. Here's our post-op able to get a complete resection by combining these two corridors. Uh, not often talked about, but this combination really is uh, uh, works well uh, together excellently. Of course, there are other anterolateral corridors, a lateral orbitotomy. We have one of the chief proponents and, and uh, uh, really one of the pioneers in that, Dr. Bill Caldwell. will be talking later about a different approach, uh, but he and I have talked about this approach quite a bit. It's one of my favorite approaches. I do it with an oculoplastic surgeon but simply by working through a lateral canthotomy or an eyelid crease plus a lateral uh, incision, we can resect tumors like this here growing uh, schwannoma. I do uh, like to stimulate the frontalis branch of the facial nerve. This allows me to ensure, you know, we can take our incision relatively far laterally, allows me to ensure I'm not entering into that. There's orbicularis. So we separate the two between frontalis and orbicularis. Here's after the lateral orbitotomy, here we can see uh, the lateral orbit. And uh, like Dr. Caldwell, I, I like to leave the orbital apex relatively intact as a retractor uh, until I'm done with most of my bone work. And here you can see uh, temporal lobe dura. And we can do a cavernous and Meckel's cave peeling the same way we would do through an open approach through this uh, access. So here's the meningeal orbital fold being cut and coagulated. And then I can dissect inferiorly here we're extending down and I can start to see Meckel's cave. Stimulating with a cartouche dissector, the temporal lobe has been shrunk back and I can see here we're uh, dissecting between branches of V2. Can land directly onto the tumor, send some specimen and then really do the same kind of dissection I would do through a larger open approach uh, for this corridor for this schwannoma. Here's just dissecting the tumor out that goes down towards V3. And then once I've dissected it free from the uninvolved nerve fibers, which I think is a critical step we often don't talk about. Uh, we talk a lot about you know, preservation of nerve fibers with acoustic neuroma, but with trigeminal, I think if you lose any uninvolved fibers, it can be equally morbid for the patient. And then finally, once we've completely resected it here, we're back at uh, the porous trigeminus and looking in with an endoscope just to ensure there's no residual. Here into the cavity, looking down towards V3 here, and then posteriorly back into the porous trigeminus. And we just use some fat to close this up. And then I let my oculoplastic surgeon, you can sometimes sew the temporalis muscle up to the periorbita for a further layer of closure. This patient did very well. And here you see immediate post-op imaging with the fat graft providing our closure. Now this can be combined uh, for, for example, this nasal angiofibroma that goes all the way out up into the middle fossa. This made me a little more nervous to have control. And also I didn't wanna have a recurrence here in the lateral sphenoid wing. So here you see after combining endonasal and transmaxillary and a lateral orbitotomy, able to get a complete resection of this tumor. <clears throat> Here's another uh, newer approach, which I think is very exciting. Here's a, a patient presenting with this petropliable pliable tumor, some very mild diplopia from what's almost certainly a chondrosarcoma extending down towards the jugular tubercle. And here's using a contralateral transmaxillary approach, which is a nice approach to get us exactly parallel to the petrous parotid. Here you can see the transnasal trajectory and <clears throat> in that figure, and then there's the, the contralateral transmaxillary trajectory. I won't belabor some of the 
earlier portions of the uh, procedure, but of course we do a nasal septal flap, which we usually do on the same side as the CTM. Here we can see the carotid, there's the uh, uh, pituitary in place, there's the contralateral carotid in the cavernous sinus. I'm doing a bit of a pituitary transposition to gain uh, access to this uh, entire tumor, which goes up towards the, uh, uh, up towards the uh, cavernous sinus. Here's our, here's our final post-op. Uh, you can see reaching all the way out to the jugular tubercle there with, for a complete resection. So CTM is a very nice option here. Here's an even larger tumor. Um, this is a young man who presented with multiple cranial neuropathies, and he actually had occlusion of his carotid, but you can see the extension of the tumor really quite laterally. Now, in this case, we didn't use, because it extended so much out even towards the cochlea, an ipsilateral transmaxillary approach would really not give us that access. So here we used endonasal plus a contralateral transmaxillary approach. So it even has sphenoamycosa over the midline portion of the tumor. There's the right posterior ethmoidal artery. So a very, very extensive tumor working out through the pterygopalatine space. This has pushed its way forward from the middle fossa. There's our right medial pterygoid plate, which has been eroded. And now finally entering into a large bulk of the tumor to debulk it. And here's peeling tumor uh, off away from the medial cavernous sinus. You can see a little bit of bleeding there. Just packing it off with some surgifoam. And here's the tumor extending now out into the middle fossa that we're trying to reach. And here you can see endonasal plus contralateral transmaxillary. And my uh, Ron Jur here is coming in through the CTM, my pituitary, just to debulk the tumor. But this allows me here to work under V2. So here you see V2 and tumor going out towards the middle fossa and even down towards the infratemporal fossa. The advantage of this over using, for example, a craniotomy on the other side is this can get me all the way down to the jugular tubercle uh, following just the course and the corridor of the tumor. So here I'm following it all the way down. We're working under V2, all the way out towards the middle fossa out towards the infratemporal fossa, and even inferiorly down towards the jugular tubercle. So it's just a, an extra corridor that I add here, Be able to peel the tumor away. Pretty significant menin, uh, schwannoma here turned out to be debulking the tumor, of course, and then finally peeling this last bit. And believe it or not, here we're all the way out to the cochlea. So this is middle fossa dura. We're on the other side of V2, middle fossa dura, and we're stimulating the cochlea and uh, seventh nerve laterally. Some, some fascia, fat, and then of course a nasal septal flap that will cover, cover all this infratemporal fossa component. Here we see the post-operative MRI. He actually did very well. Here we can see just the cavity that's left behind, probably a small residual on the lateral edge of the carotid artery, but otherwise and down the infratemporal fossa, but otherwise very satisfied with our resection through this approach. Uh, and here we can see the final. Another way these are, I think, very well combined and much more challenging tumors, and Dr. Fernandez and I have done a fair number of these this way, is, is combining in the cavernous sinus. And of course, Dr. Fernandez has published a lot on the cavernous sin uh, medial cavernous sinus uh, to help us understand the different compartments. And here's an example of uh, uh, a case where you have a young woman who presents with some vision loss, well, what's a relatively small tumor, but the tumor really heavily involves the cavernous sinus. So in this case, we would do first an endonasal to uh, debulk that area. Here we can see the opening into the cella, there's significant involvement of the cella, but here we're working in the medial cavernous sinus component. We're going to debulk that component of it. We can visualize the carotid artery, you can see the relationship of the tumor to the pituitary. And then sharply dissecting between the pituitary and the meningioma itself. Often these will push the pituitary gland anteriorly and will take up the space of the posterior clinoid. So we have to do at least a hemi transposition of the gland, which the tumor sort of does for us. And then work all the way up to the diaphragma decompress the optic. And then we will of course want to leave some tumor on the carotid artery in this case, because what we don't want to do is damage the carotid artery. 
Uh, and with any meningioma in the cavernous sinus, there's always concern for invasion of the adventitia by tumor. Here's resecting the involved diaphragma. So I want to resect all tumor here that really is involving uh, this medial cavernous sinus and then working my way back to the posterior clinoid. Drilling out the involved posterior clinoid, working between the cavernous carotid and the pituitary, and then resecting any involved dura of the dorsum cellae and the upper clivus. Finally, uh, after this, we'll place some uh, we'll place some fat into that area, place some fat in there to separate the gland from the cavernous sinus because we know that we're going to need to probably radiate this. And then, of course, next we would do the same kind of cavernous sinus peeling. And, and uh, I don't go into the cavernous sinus for many of these. I just try to resect the extra cavernous portion in order to uh, relieve the patient of their symptom. So that's a, another example of combining an antromedial and an antralateral corridor. Here's a much larger tumor. This is a 65-year-old man who presented with uh, not only optic neuropathy, but also a partial third nerve palsy from the cavernous sinus exposure. We did the same endoscopic and a nasal approach, and then followed this with an orbitozygomatic approach. And here you can see the final result. You can see some fat here immediately post-op. And this is all disease that is purely in the cavernous sinus. I haven't gone into the, uh, uh, haven't gone into the orbital apex for the cavernous sinus. Uh, and have managed to uh, preserve his function in those areas. His third nerve has now improved and we're able to probably treat that with radiosurgery. Another example of a, a similar kind of uh, procedure where you can either do the OZ first or the endonasal first, depending on exactly how uh, you think you uh, want to debulk. And uh, truthfully, if they have an optic neuropathy and often, uh, for example, women may present uh, with pituitary dysfunction, I'll do the endonasal portion first and then do the craniotomy second. Uh, the condyle is another area we can combine uh, endonasal and open far lateral around the hypoglossal canal. Here's a, a young girl who presented with this tumor was biopsied, turned out to be uh, a poorly differentiated chordoma, which often can respond very well to chemotherapy. She underwent an Ewing sarcoma protocol, had an excellent tumor response, but she didn't tolerate it so well. She progressed despite other treatments and now was left with this progressive tumor, which involved the majority of the clivus extending all the way into the condyle, but even lateral to the hypoglossal canal. So there's a significant amount of condyle involvement. She, you can see the involvement of the vertebral artery on the right side here. <clears throat> so you have a lot of options here perhaps for this, but I think this is a, a great example of trying to come at it from two different ends in order to try to get a complete resection. So we did uh, uh, an endoscopic and a nasal far medial approach and followed by a, a quote far lateral approach. We're running a little short on time. So I'll sort of skip ahead to hopefully what will be the final towards the final view. Here's the paraclival carotid artery. You can see removing the bone over the carotid and the lingula here. And then debulking the tumor all the way from the floor of the cella all the way down to here we're entering into the condyle. She already, uh, she did not have a fixation yet, but that was planned as part of this. <clears throat> Resecting the disease on, uh, on C1 and even down to C2. I'd be curious to know Dr. Caldwell's thoughts on using that ELTO for resecting a tumor like this. You know, how high can you get with that particular approach? Drilling even the contralateral side because the tumor initially had involvement there. So I wanted to resect the entire left lateral mass and condyle. And here's drilling out all the way to the hypoglossal canal from an endonasal perspective. The only, uh, thankfully, the periosteum was involved, not the inner layer of dura, as you can see here. So by removing bone and periosteum and resecting all the way out to the hypoglossal canal, I can resect all of the medial corridor. We then combine that with an extreme lateral approach. Here you can see we've mobilized uh, the vertebral artery in V3 segment, just putting some papaverin on it. I can then proceed to drill. Uh, I can then proceed to drill out uh, the condyle laterally. There's drilling out the condyle. You can see a lot of the tumor here is very calcified. Here's resecting the rest of the lateral mass of, of C1, actually fused after the patient had her initial uh, response to chemotherapy. Here's removing the lateral mass, drilling out the remainder of the condyle. Again, I'll see the hypoglossal nerve now from the other side. I'm starting to see the fat that was placed endonasally. 
and I can peel out that last bit of tumor, and here's our, our, final, uh, our final result. Putting some fat from the back to meet, re reach the fat in the front, and able to get uh, what's a gross total resection, but of course, likely not a cure for this patient. So combining these corridors can often be uh, really, I think, the secret to getting a much more radical resection than trying to push one corridor too far, even can be used for petrocleibal meningiomas. Here's endonasal plus an extended RMC. Here's a woman who presented another uh, uh, petrocleibal with significant gait difficulties, resected this endonasally. She had already been shunted because she had an MPH type of picture initially. And then I did an RMC. And she has this very small cavernous sinus residual left, which you could either observe or do gamma knife for, uh, depending on whether or not you thought this was going to progress or not. So I think by combining these corridors, we can avoid crossing nerves. The less we manipulate nerves, I think the better these patients do. And that's really the golden or cardinal rule that we're trying to follow. Um, Skull-based corridors, of course, it's not so simple as the anatomy. Every single one of these approaches has a learning curve, whether it's open or endonasal. You have to learn the anatomy, you have to learn the surgical techniques, and you have to learn the different complications that you can cause and try to avoid in these different surgeries. This is the, the training levels that we propose for endoscopic surgery. And here you can see as we go in increasing levels, the increasing number of complications, increasing blood loss, et cetera. Um, so every single one of these approaches becomes more challenging. Um, so I, uh, ideally we would approach uh, uh, surgery, select, uh, approach selection based on the relationship of the tumor to the anatomy. But of course you have to consider the relief of symptoms and maximize tumor control. And, and never forget your own experience, never uh, uh, underestimate the power impact of your own inexperience and the patient's goals must be equally weighted to these other factors. This is just a text we have coming soon, which I'm fortunate to have, um, I think pretty much everyone on this uh, webinar involved with. And I want to thank you for that. And, uh, and of course, invite everyone to join the Skull-Based Congress, which is a, a free web-based uh, web uh, community for Skull-Based discussion. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you for this fantastic, of course, tour de force. As always, you've crammed a lot of very uh, good material in the 20 minutes. That's not an easy feat in itself. And we're, uh, we'll save all the questions, of course, till the end. We won't have questions after every speaker. Very good. I think you made an excellent point for using multiple corridors in some of these uh, very complex lesions. So we'll go straight to Juan. Juan, uh, if you don't mind, tell us your wisdom about craniopharyngiomas. Uh, what f is formidable about them and what is your current thinking about how to tackle them? Thank you. Thanks, Jax. Thanks so much for the invitation, Paul. Great talk as always. Uh, very uh, exciting. So um, I wanted to share uh, this topic on craniopharyngiomas. As Jack said, is a topic that I really enjoyed. This is my this is my conflict of interest. Um, my team at Stanford, both for uh, endonasal and lateral skull based surgery, great team. And my uh, team in the in the laboratory, um, whose work you're gonna see also in this in this lecture. So yeah, kernel foramen as Harvey Cousin said, are the most formidable of intracranial tumors, and there is uh, some truth to that because they they can be really challenging tumors to deal with. Um, as you will see, it's a type of tumor that mixes or requires both the expertise of the skull base surgeon and the brain tumor surgeon, because these tumors involve the hypothalamic and uh, pituitary stock axis. And understanding the hypothalamus is not easy. This is the hypothalamus right here, part of it. Of course, the mammillary bodies are part of the hypothalamus. This is the tuberal region of the hypothalamus, and therefore the one that is uh, mostly involved with uh, craniopharyngiomas. And um, we can take another look at the uh, hypothalamic region, tuberal region of the hypothalamus. Then we have the supraopticate and we have the mammillary bodies. And it's important to have a rough idea of where are the nuclei of the hypothalamus. And if you look at this diagram, you realize that actually the endonasal approach, as you will see, has multiple benefits among them. It's not only the optic apparatus preservation, but also the visualization of the hypothalamic region and how you get access directly to this area of the hypothalamus, which is the one that is most involved in uh, kernel pharyngiomas. And then you avoid uh, or you decrease the risk of injuring the hypothalamic nuclei that are around it as you were coming from other approaches that don't come from below, but from the side or from above. 
These are some dissections done by uh, one of my fellows, Max, in the lab. Phenomenal dissections. We are trying to study the connections of the hypothalamus and the different nuclei because sometimes it's all about you know doing a good superior dissection right in this region of the floor of the third ventricle. And you see there is a PL plane here, and this superior dissection found in this plane becomes so relevant. At the same time, you see the third ventricular floor has these nuclei, and they are very relevant. And uh, the first thing we look at coronal pharyngiomas, and probably all of you are familiar with this classification, is what is the relationship of the tumor with the floor of the third ventricle? Especially, is the tumor purely in the third ventricle, and therefore the floor is all intact? therefore coming from below is a mistake because you will go through intact hypothalamic nuclei um, or is the hip, the floor pushed up like the extraventricular type or is the tumor actually arising from the floor and the floor is actually broken and you, you are going to have the hypothalamic nuclei on each side around the tumor like a collar like a belt and you need to dissect in that sup arachnid sup PL plane the tumor of the hypothalamic tissue so a tumor like this, there are two different types of tumors. They look similar, but they are not. This one has an intact floor, the third ventricle. This one does not. So this one is one that you, is purely interventricular, and you want to do some sort of transventricular approach, either to the lamina or to transcalosa. For all other tumors that are not purely interventricular, always the decision is, do I go through an endonasal approach, or do I use either a transylvian interhemispheric approach, especially for the uh, cellular, supracellular type, or do I do for the tuberin infundibular type, those that arise from the floor of the third ventricle, do I do an endonasal approach or a transventricular approach? Sometimes even as Yasa Hill proposed in the past, you have to combine both. Uh, he proposed combining transcalosal with cisternal or transylvian approaches for some of these very challenging uh, tumors. The beauty of the endonasal approach is by coming uh, from an inferior to superior trajectory right in the midline, you are working directly into the long axis of the tumor. You work into the infracasmatic space and you have direct access to uh, the both carotids uh, early identification of the pituitary stock and of the uh, hypophyseal branches the approach is actually not large because you use typically typically the anterior limit as the limbus of the sphenoid this dural fold right here um, because the carotid must grow in a superior direction towards the third ventricle floor so there is no point on exposing the anterior skull base you just need this space your working corridor is going to be between the optic apparatus and the pituitary gland. And in that core, you have the stock and you have the hypophyseal artery, superior hypophyseal artery branches. Understanding these branches is very important because when you aim to preserve uh, the pituitary stock function, you wanna preserve these branches. Uh, on even more important, you wanna preserve the vascular supply to the optic apparatus. And as we said, our core is between the optic nerve and between the, uh, the pituitary gland. And uh, different than coming from a process from above where you ha often have to do some manipulation of the optic nerves, going endonasally, there is no manipulation of the optic apparatus. You manipulate, on the other hand, the pituitary gland. You just display inferiorly to gain some, some uh, additional exposure. That is often enough. In more extreme cases, as you will see, there are very large tumors. You actually mobilize the pituitary gland, uh, which, of course, carries the risk of pituitary dysfunction. More so if you do an intradural transposition than you do a trans uh, cavernous or interdural. But depending on what you need, you can use one or the other. And this gives you unparalleled um, access to the uh, you know, basilar bifurcation area, the basal systems in general, but especially the interpeduncular system where uh, there is so much important uh, uh, anatomy. So at the end, coming in the nasally allows you to access all this infracasmatic retroinfundibular space, localize the floor of the third ventricle, and, and perform this accurate supial dissection technique, which is so important for complete tumor resection and for preservation of function. I'm going to quickly review my experience at Stanford with kernel pharyngiomas. We did uh, 24 patients, 27 operations, uh, for three, three of them already recurrent, uh, 25 endonasal, two transcranial, uh, eight pediatric, 16 adult, and you see this at the gross total resection versus near total resection. So I tend to be quite aggressive with resections, as you will see, uh, although there are exceptions. Um, and here, this is an interesting topic of discussion always. Uh, do we try to preserve the stock? And I almost, not always, but I try to preserve the stock as much as possible. There are cases where it's absolutely impossible. Up front, I know that. But in all others, I try to preserve the stock. And as you will see, of 12 cases that you preserve the stock in adults, only four, four had some function preserved. So 
even you do your best, sometimes the stock is so thin that it's non, not actually functional. Um, this really, especially as you will see, some of these are very complex tumors. Some of them are easier, but the complex tumors are the ones that carry the complications. You see there are, I have a patient with a vascular in you, a small thalamic stroke, as you will see. I have some CSF leaks, and the risk of panhypopituitarism is, is very high, especially for the complex tumors. Most patients have visual improvement. Um, this is, again, the pituitary function uh, outcomes, which depends so much on the tumor. Now, for example, this is a chronic phonema that I don't think is a complex one. It's more a, a, more a uh, routine chronic phonema. It tends a bit lateral, but it's mostly cystic. Um, this patient has intact function and has visual loss. So I'm going to show you this as an example of just a quick approach. You know, of course, the sepal flap is always the first step. Uh, then a good exposure of the uh, um, cella and the uh, up to the uh, precasmatic sulcus and limus of the sphenoid. A good dural opening. I like to open towards the limus of the sphenoid to get a good a visualization of the optic apparatus. And I like to cut the dura up to the level to the level of the distal dural ring so I can see the carotid intradurally, the supraclinal carotid. Um, but I want to show you how important it is to preserve this little branch right here. This is um, others that are around. This is a branch of the superhypophysial artery. And what you see is given sun supply, especially to the infundibulum right here. And here I'm trying to preserve the pituitary function. That is a nice stalk that I actually I was able to peel the tumor from the stalk. And then, but I have to work around these branches uh, carefully. And it's so easy to get distracted and this abolish this branch. So you need to keep concentration at all times so you don't uh, injure this. And it's not only this one in the front, but you see this one in the back here. And the ones in the back, the secondary, as we call them, hypophysial arteries, superhypophysial arteries, sometimes are even more important because they can go towards the optic tract, perhaps. In this case, it probably goes towards the infundibulum also. But every perforating branch in this area needs to be preserved. There is only one exception. There is sometimes branches of the superhypophysial artery that go to the dura of the pituitary of the diaphragm, and those you can take. Um, but all others, you're going to preserve as much as possible. So this is a tumor where we can preserve all these nice branches. You saw that small one. Finally, I've been able to dissect it, although it was completely stuck to the tumor. And then this is a tumor that allows us to do a good, complete tumor resection. There is the uh, last piece of tumor that is stuck to the optic apparatus. And you see how flattened that optic apparatus is because of this uh, mass effect. The stock has been nicely preserved. And that little bit of tumor that is stuck to the optic tract, I'm gonna go and carefully dissect it and achieve a complete tumor resection. The stock is preserved, the vessels are preserved. So this is the ideal kernel for angioma. I wish all kernel for angiomas were like this. Unfortunately, they are not. And, uh, but this one is an excellent outcome. Improved vision back to normal, intact function, no complications. You see the nice stock preserved. Um, again, this is the ideal kernel for angioma. Now, this is also a bit more controversial. This is a patient, and it's an older patient, presented with blurry vision, with amnesia, drowsiness. You see, she has large vents. The tumor is mostly cystic and is into the third ventricle. And I see the stock is pushed forward. I know that if I do this case endonasally, I'm going to sacrifice the pituitary function almost certainly. And since it's mostly cystic, uh, elderly woman, I'm going to be maybe a bit more conservative in this case, trying to preserve the function. So in this case, I'm going to go transclosal. And the idea is to preserve the function for this uh, patient, even if I don't get a complete tumor resection, I might be okay leaving some tumor by the stock. This is doing an interhemispheric approach, patient in lateral position to allow with gravity. You see, we're using this cool feature, which is uh, augmented reality. So I can superimpose the tumor and the optic chasm, and especially the tumor uh, um, uh, overlay helps me define the uh, extension of my callosotomy, which as you see is very small right here and is tailored to the tumor. Um, in this case, you will see later is, is 10 to 15 millimeters callosotomy only. And then we're going to do a, a careful transcoroidal approach. Um, not ex I'm not going to sacrifice any vein. I'm just going to find the venous confluence where the septal vein and the thalamus three vein come together. And that gives me enough. That's enough opening of the choroidal fissure to get to the posterior aspect of the tumor and then find my plane of dissection uh, posteriorly. And since it's mostly cystic, this is not such a difficult uh, dissection. Uh, you see my space is quite limited. My visualization is also limited, um, but it's enough to, to do what I want to do in this case. I can, I'm doing a septostomy here so I can work through the other foramen of Monroe, which is key so I can get access to the tumor on the 
control as aspect of the tumor. So we finally opened to the system. We were seeing there the supracellular system. And now this is the dissection of the tumor from the hypothalamus. But here I'm coming from above. So I'm risking some of the hypothalamic nuclei above. So always be very careful with that. And lastly, I'm seeing the calcification down the stock. I'm going to remove part of this, but this is when I'm going to stop. Because if I keep going, I'm going to injure the stock. And then that would defeat the purpose. So this is the uh, post-op to see the sand residual on the pituitary stock, but this patient had intact pituitary function and excellent outcome. Um, uh, no recurrence so far. We'll see if there is a recurrence, then maybe this wasn't such a great idea. Some other cases um, that um, we've done, for example, this very he heavily calcified canopharyngioma with progressive visual loss. This is one that uh, I have low expectation to preserve the pituitary function, but I'm still going to try. And you see, again, in this case, preserving the branches of the superior hypophysial artery is more difficult. And you need to be selective on the ones you sacrifice. Some of those that I'm cutting and quadrant are going directly to the capsule of the tumor, and those I need to take. But the remaining ones need to be preserved. You see, they set the tumor off directly the basilar bifurcation. And in this case, there was a huge calcification that was really uh, hard, very solid. And I couldn't debulk it because it was moving and bouncing on the optic apparatus. So I had to remove it in one piece. It barely uh, fit through the uh, uh, opening and through the, nails, through the nostrils. And they were going to go and do the rest. In this case, the stock has been preserved, but it's a thin stock and it didn't work after the operation. So preservation is structurally, but non-functionally, as unfortunately happens quite often. Um, now we come into more challenging cases and this is a patient that was found in coma at his uh, 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 home uh, you know large ventricle ventricles um, multiple cystic tumor so the first thing uh, we place EBDs actually in both sides because he was not getting better and the ventricles were trapped and then a few days later he gets better and we open on him so and we go through an endonasal approach uh, and you will see why because they have an excellent corridor to get into the tumor this is some of the planning we can do before surgery to uh, understand a bit better the uh, relationship of the tumor with the uh, neurovascular structures around. You see the extension of the, uh, the extent of the approach is the same. I stop at the limbus of the sphenoid. Huge tumor, but it still is the same corridor between limbus of the sphenoid and the pituitary gland. But the pituitary gland, you see I'm displacing it down. Again, can I preserve the function in this tumor? There is no way. Um, perhaps I'm gonna try, but I'm gonna give up as I see that the stock is completely embedded by tumor. But of course, I need to do this arachnoid dissection, preserve all the vessels around. Uh, we go into the tumor and the bulk it uh, aggressively so I can start mobilizing. But again, for me, Kernophonyngema first is about doing this systemal arachnoidal dissection of vessels. And as you will see, as we get deeper into the third ventricle floor right now, that is a super dissection technique where we have to find the plane between the hypothalamus and tumor. Uh, to me, it's very helpful to find the mammillary bodies that serve as the posterior landmark and reference of the hypothalamus. Uh, and also you need to rely on the texture of the tissue and, and the appearance of the tissue and the vascularity also, and uh, carefully trimming it. And once you trim and detach, you can pull, but only after you have detached and trim it. If you pull directly, you can injure the hypothalamus. Um, uh, so you need to be uh, careful about that. So a lot of sort of dissection, cutting tumor off directly the hypothalamus, you can see the EBD on the enlarged ventricle. And this is at the end of our resection. You see those calcifications along the ventricular wall. Those you don't want to remove. Those you're going to keep. And something that is interesting, you see the enhancement post-op. Um, but this is immediately post-op. This is later post-op. You see how the enhancement has, at uh, three months, has decreased. And this is something which I've seen many times. So uh, seeing some enhancement immediately post-op doesn't mean there's a residual tumor. Um, and often it gets better uh, and further MRIs. Um, and this is the patient with an excellent outcome, no pituitary function and full replacement, but back to work, back to normal life. Even a larger, more complex tumor, because this one is, you know, extending retrocellular, retroclival also, and even laterally. So this patient had, is one of the first I did here at Stanford. They had placed an omaya, but it was obstructed. Uh, they did a biopsy. It, it was really considered, a, you know, a very difficult tumor to operate. And, um, he was progressively losing vision, calcified, uh, partially calcified, but probably micro calcification. So uh, in this case, I'm going to try to preserve the pituitary function. So I'm mobilizing the pituitary gland. That's a full mobilization intradural and extending this with a transclival approach. So it's a 
supracellular to transclavial approach with the pituitary gland being mobilized. Third nerve on one side being uh, dissected. Again, this is the superior plane at the level of the floor of the third ventricle, uh, putting a cotonoid to protect that plane. And uh, uh, that's the cyst that goes towards the uncus and above the third nerve. And what you see up there is the uncus. And then this is streaming again sharply the tumor uh, that is in the uh, extending to the hypothalamic region. And uh, in this case, I preserved the pituitary gland and the stock was mobilized. Uh, that's the interface with the hypothalamus. That's when I, where I stop. And, uh, but this patient did not have pituitary function either. Even if I try my best, it was, it was not functioning, but you see the whole dissection of the vascular bifurcation. And uh, uh, what I believe is a complete tumor resection. That's what the MRI showed. And this patient is more than two years uh, since this operation with, with uh, uh, no recurrence and uh, excellent outcome, of course, in full replacement. Um, similar with this one. In this one, I directly could not save the stock. So in this case, I actually even took the pituitary gland out because there was no way I could save it. I get more space. I can do a full transcribal and do an excellent resection. What I'm really worried in a case like this, you see that hypothalamus is trapped right here. You see how it looks it looks, how good it looks post-op. You need to be so careful with this uh, plane of dissection up here. And finally, I want to show you what I call inoperable kernel for angioma. Some of those that I've done um, here at Stanford that you know were truly challenging. For example, first this first case here, seven previous operations, uh, radiation twice. This one, five operations, radiation three times, and uh, now offer chemotherapy. This one, three operations, radiation times two, 32 cis aspirations. Um, this one, a two year old with a giant kernel for angioma. So, um, this is one that again, it's a very challenging uh, case, 52 year old. Excuse me. This is, with, again, as I said, you know, two craniotomies, endonasal, IMRT, uh, Temodar, Omaya, uh, 32 cis aspirations to the point that the, there is uh, con persistent and con progressive visual loss. So, um, but this is a tumor we can actually remove completely. This is, you need to do an uh, aggressive exposure, aggressive resection, and I'm gonna go all the way to the end. Um, and uh, you see the optical process doesn't look very good. Uh, that's the remaining of the resection, cut the stock right at the uh, tubular part of the hypothalamus. And this is the post-op. Um, there is no stock preserved, the stock is gone. So he has now the eye he didn't have before, but now this is a complete resection. I'm really hopeful that this patient will remain uh, with no recurrence uh, for the uh, following years. He never had a resection that was this complete. It was, he always had significant amount of tumor left on all of previous operations. Um, this other case, for example, this was the, the one, the only patient I had a stroke post-op. This one has a thalamic stroke. Fortunately, it did not uh, impact him much. Just transient mild hemiparesis, he recovered from that. Um, this patient got a uh, seven previous operations radiation. I got a not complete resection. I had to leave tumor encasing both carotid arteries in the supraclonal space. And this patient had a recurrence uh, and I didn't operate again. I just replaced him on Mavasti because he's just too invasive and he's a patient that is not a good surgical candidate anymore, I believe. But at least two years of you know, better quality of life with surgery. This one also was a very unique case because this um, was a tumor operated five times before, all through transphenoidal macroscopic approaches, not endonasal, but microscopic. And the residual tumor in the cavernous sinus kept enlarging. So um, he, was off, he was offered nothing else than chemotherapy at that point. He had a very severe uh, ICA narrowing, as you see up there. And in retrospect, that is from so much radiation, uh, as you will see. So I went first in the nasal in this case. And this is what remains of the pituitary. He actually still has pituitary function and we were able to keep, keep it uh, intact. So I'm going uh, into the cell and remove the tumor on the other side. There was still tumor on the cell, calcif calcified uh, tumor, et cetera. Now I'm going into the cavernous sinus. This patient has a complete thermal palsy. So he has a, a closed eye. Uh, in, in a case like that, uh, I don't have to worry about the cranial nerves. So I can be very aggressive on that cavernous sinus. We did a beautiful resection. I was very happy with, with him, no complications. Um, he did very well. And he was two years with no recurrence, but recently he had a recurrence in the paraclinial and supraclinial space. And he was, uh, it was growing, as you will see, off the roof of the cavernous sinus. His ICA was, steno was uh, stenotic from narrowed from radiation. So this is his uh, vascular study. So we did an STMCA bypass with uh, Dr. Steinberg and then we did the radical resection at the same time. I performed a cavernous sinus with carotid 
uh, sacrifice. And uh, I did a, a, massive, a, a super extensive resection. The whole roof of the cavern of sinus was removed. The in, inside of the cavern of sinus, there was no max tumor inside the cavern of sinus. It was all growing off the lining of the roof that I didn't remove in the first operation. But by doing this, you know, it's an extradural approach. Um, and that's the tumor growing off the roof of the cavern of sinus. So I'm going to find the carotid. I'm going to put a clip that's the pecum just below the, the, the pecum. So I could actually transect the carotid um, and do a cavern of sinus exanteration uh, for this patient. And uh, this is the post op. The patient had a CS oblique post op that I had to repair through an endonasal approach, but he had no new deficits. And I'm um, again hopeful that he will remain with no recurrence because this is as aggressive as I can get. Uh, trying to cure this disease that is sometimes so rebel and so difficult to deal with. And I will finish with this case uh, because this is the story of a two-year-old kid. And, uh, you know, with this large tumor that had been approached at a different institution first with a transfrontal uh, cyst fenestration, the tumor uh, grew and uh, family got a multiple opinions on what to do with this case. And I thought in the nasal was possible. I never tried in a, such a young kid, but you see the whole uh, sphenoid channel is all calcified, but we can drill all that and do a good exposure of this uh, uh, tumor. And this is the, uh, you can also work through a two-year-old nostrils. They are quite flexible and there are challenges there, but you can overcome those challenges and um, you can learn how to work in a smaller corridors. And basically we drill from the anterior skull base down to the clivus and from one orbit to the other, all bone was removed. But again, the same landmarks are there. That was the limbus of the sphenoids I just transected. This is the calcified portion of the tumor being removed. This patient had no P23 function to start. That always makes our job easier. We don't have to worry about preserving the stock. And uh, here is the basilar bifurcation um, and the PCOM. And you see the, that uh, interface. This is the supial plane that is so important to develop with the uh, posterior part of the hypothalamus there. And then removing all the tumor extending into the ventricle. And I'm going to see also complications and how to deal with it. You know, this uh, resection went wonderfully. I was very happy, but when we were finishing, uh, there was some arterial bleeding underneath that patty. Uh, not sure exactly how that happened, but there was arterial bleeding. And so I checked the PCOM had been evolved from the P1 and uh, no active bleeding, but as I explored it and I tried to seal that opening, I just make it worse and it starts bleeding more. So then you're in trouble because you have, you know, arterial bleeding from the P1, it's in a deep corridor, uh, shooting blood into the third ventricle. I have a patty protecting there and two-year-old corridor is, you know, narrow. And I insist with the, 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 the bipolar is not working. So then this, I must confess this, I learned from uh, Paul using these nice clips, these single subappliers, and we carefully and precisely place this clip right on the vessel, just on the avulsion of the PCOM to uh, uh, stop the bleeding. And it went right on. Uh, great shot there, so very satisfied with that. And that's, uh, um, that solved the problem. Now we continue with some more resection to make sure uh, we reinforce it. Um, but this patient ended up doing really well with, um, this is the post uh MRI with what I thought it was a complete resection. I really did not see residual tumor in this MRI. It looks so clean. Um, he did very well for two years. Uh, well, let me just take back complications. Another complication from this same patient, nine days post-op, he developed massive nevocephalus. What happened, there was a uh, failure of the nasal flap. It was necrosed. Uh, we tried to repair it again, but it didn't work. So I had to relay into doing what is called a temporal parallel fascia flap. So that's an incision based on the STA. We transpose it through the pterygopath in fossa. You can see the transposition there. And uh, this is a very robust uh, flap because it's vascularized of the superficial temporal artery. And you can lay down on the whole clivus and uh, supracellular region, and this uh, made a trick. That's fascia lata first, and then this is the vascularized septal uh, um, TP flap. And uh, with this, uh, the patient had an excellent healing, and uh, you can see how robust is that uh, that reconstruction. Now, the patient did very well for one the, one minute, if you don't mind, one minute. Yeah. That's exactly what I need. Thank you. So. Two years later, he unfortunately he had a recurrence, and uh, even though I thought he was a complete resection, but these kind of phenomena are like this. Sometimes they are so rebel, and there was just a cystic recurrence, but he was having some visual loss from that. So, you see the tippy flap. I just peel it off. This is two years later, and that is the cyst. And I work on the cyst, and uh, 
aggressively, remove it completely. You can see the clip from the first operation, some of the scar from the previous operation. And I'm trying to really peel this off the optic apparatus back to the hypothalamus again and get as complete a sort of section as I can. And at the end, I was very happy. I even sent some of those pieces to pathology to see if they see tumor in there and they don't see any residual tumor. Uh, and this is the post-op. And in this case, since we have thick tissue, I was able to even put some stitches. We had the trauma from the previous CSF leak. So I just wanted to close it uh, really well. So this is putting some stitches there to close that uh, thick tissue. And uh, then that's his fascia lat again. And then we're going to put the tippy flag back again so you can reuse it. And he did not leak it, it wonderfully. And this is uh, uh, the patient like a, like a ninja with recovered vision and, and a very good outcome. And I'm so hopeful that this would be it for him and for, and for his family. So to conclude, canopharyngioma surgery is, uh, requires skull-based and brain surgery expertise because of the uh, aspects we mentioned. The endonasal approach provides an ideal corridor for even the most complex canopharyngiomas. It provides this unique privileged view of the chasmatic hypothalamic dis dissection plane, which is so important. We review some of the key surgical anatomy and nuances. Even we saw how to uh, prevent and manage vascular injury, particularly the peak count for these uh, chronophonyma cases is the one at the highest risk. And obviously surgical, surgical training experience uh, skills determine the operability of many of these chronophonyomas and the outcome of these uh, complex chronophonyomas. With this, uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Juan, thank you so much. Beautiful videos, be beautiful anatomy. Those uh, dissections that your fellow is doing are unbelievable. This is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to upset many of our Roto Roton friends in Roton society, but this is, this is unbelievable. I'm not going to say more. Than, I'm, I'm not going to say what I was going to say, but this is really spectacular. It is a spectacular. Like we call him Max Da Vinci. That's his, uh, you know, wow. <laughs> He really is so good. He's the best I've seen. Wow. The fiber tracks uh, spectacular. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you. Um, thank you. We're saving the questions till the end. Okay. Now, slight change of uh, pace. Uh, Aaron, if you could... Oh, yeah. Here we go. Uh, Aaron, hopefully we can hear you. And tell us, Aaron, if we can... We should remove acoustic tumors endonasally since we've had two excellent endonasal uh, talks here. Go ahead, Aaron. Welcome. Are you speaking, Aaron? Are you muted? We can't hear you. Uh, Ignacio? Uh, I, 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 oh, now I hear you. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, there is some audio feedback. But we can hear you. Jacques, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, Aaron. Now I hear you. Yes, Aaron. Now I hear you. Uh, is the quality of the audio okay, Jacques? Yes, excellent. Yes, excellent. Oh, I think Thank I know so what's much. going on. I'm so sorry. I, I think, doctor, I think you have it on speaker. So it's going to be repeating itself we're going to be hearing the echo every time you speak it's like a second delay so if you have a speaker just turn off the speaker because we can hear it you're going to be hearing yourself talk oh he went away did, did he disconnect uh, Ignacio? i think he disconnected doctor yes no i am okay right oh, now. oh you're can there great so I don't hear uh, myself twice. Everything is good. Can you guys hear me okay? Now, now you sound perfect, doctor. Okay. okay. Right. Reconnect oh, your... Sure. Yeah. Go, Go ahead. Um, so I want to thank Jacques for spectacular sessions. Really, this has been an amazing offering uh, and has made such a big difference in this time of uh, virtual education. So Jacques, I want to really congratulate you in an incredible pioneer status you have had in advancing virtual neurosurgical education. Um, you're still hearing me okay, Jacques? Yes, yes, perfect. So um, I um, was asked to talk about something for a skull base. And for me, acoustic tumors are still considered complex skull base surgery, definitely not endonasal, but definitely are such challenging tumors. As you know, 
acoustic tumors can be difficult or be very difficult. And today I wanna to discuss what is um, really the case for resection of these tumors. These are some of basic standards that we all know, you know, 80% of CP angle tumors and um, there is about, you know, 2,300 or so cases a year. Uh, what are the patients selected for surgery? Tumors with mass effect, cystic tumors, um, cystic tumors, tumors causing hydrocephalus, when the diagnosis is doubt and obviously patient preference. This is a tumor where none of us will question surgery is the way to go. It's a large tumor, a lot of edema and mass effect and surgery is the way. Also, C1 with a recurrent left acoustic neuroma presenting with a new gait dysfunction and seventh nerve uh, weakness is all obviously another good um, case, especially when it's cystic uh, for surgical resection. This is another case, 61 year old with um, a um, tumor that did very well, obviously from the last case. And there is different staging of these tumors, as you know, in terms of what stage they are and which ones are more palatable for surgery. And obviously stage four are the tumors that we're talking today. So this is, for example, another patient, 60 year old woman with uh, hearing issues, complete seven nerve palsy. And there was a question about what is the pathology in this case? And if there is a question about the pathology, obviously surgery is still the best way to go. And in this case, it was noted to be an icon aneurysm, even though it was initially thought potentially to be an acoustic neuroma. So if there is a question about the pathology, again, surgery is the best approach for uh, determining diagnosis and proceeding with um, uh, obviously managing the lesion. This is some of the more controversial tumors, 50 year old male with moderate hearing loss, small tumor, which you remove in order to save the hearing through surgery rather than weight or do, um, uh, which would potentially lead to complete hearing loss or radio surgery. There's a high risk of um, hearing loss as well. The question is what is really in the hands of an individual surgeon, the rate of hearing preservation in these cases with a small acoustic with a moderate hearing loss. And that's something that still the um, jury is out on that. You still can hear me okay, Jacques? Uh, yes, Aaron, we're hearing you very well. Luckily it's going well. Thank you. And so the, what are the surgical approaches? I think we talk about retrosigmoid, translap, middle fossa, and obviously there are extended middle fossa, posterior petrosectomy, presigmoid, retrolab, transcochlear. I think as neurosurgeons, we're really in favor of a retrosigmoid approach. And I'll go through the um, reasons behind that. Obviously, what are the uh, uh, patient's, patient selection criteria, hearing status, tumor size, relationship to the IAC and the fundus and the relevant adjacent anatomy, including, including the jugular ball. And obviously sometimes convenience and scheduling with our ENT colleagues can make a, a significant difference. Why is the retrosigmoid approach so good and adaptable? There is no tumor size limitations. The uh, hearing preservation is possible. Really the panoramic view of posterior fossa is so good. It is much more efficient because it won't take hours of a translap drilling. There is no abdominal fat required. And it's really truly the best posture of efficiency and the flexibility of approach is so remarkable that is absolutely my most favorite approach for any size tumor. Obviously this is a very giant acoustic uh, patient of mine who was pregnant 24 um, weeks um, pregnant and came in with facial weakness, significant ataxia, grew significantly during pregnancy. And we went ahead and did the shunting. She had hydrocephalus and then resected a tumor about a month later after she uh, delivered her, healthy, her uh, healthy son. So what are the disadvantages of retrosigmoid approach? Can be difficult to access the latter one third of the IAC without violating the labyrinth. There could be potential high rate of post-operative headaches, although cranioplasty may admit that significantly. IC drilling after dural opening could lead to more 
uh, chance of um, um, uh, aseptic meningitis, poss possibly, and obviously higher recurrence rate and uh, potentially higher risk of CSF leak. Again, none of those last few differences have been determined in adequate studies, and those are our retrospect retrospective reviews. What is the advantage of the translabyrinthian approach? Uh, it allows early identification of the seventh nerve lateral to the tumor in the IEC. Bone removal is completed prior to opening the dura, lower incidence of postoperative headaches. And there's quite, again, retrospective review about lower chance of recurrence. Translab approach, it's definitely a longer operation. By the time you get into dural, it's almost noon. And uh, obviously the closure is more lengthy as well. Large abdominal fat graft, significant limitation, superior inferior exposure, unfamiliar anchor angle of use for the neurosurgeon, no opportunity for serving, uh, saving hearing and high rate of CSF leak. Middle fossa approach, best approach uh, for uh, hearing preservation. Bone removal is again prior to opening the dura. Lower incidence of postoperative headaches and definitely the lowest incidence of CSF leaks. What are the disadvantages? Tumor size limitations. Obviously the tumor has to be small uh, because of the angle of the view and uh, the facial nerve can be on your way and potentially at more risk and limited access to the posterior fossa small fat graph often is required and certainly temporal retraction can be a limitation in this case. But again, for a 17 year old male with four months of imbalance, a small tumor and uh, some uh, service of healing, I think a middle fossa approach can be a very nice um, offering. These are the anatomy is by Dr. Rotan. All of us know about the approach to the IEC and the um, location of the nerves in comparison to each other. I wanna just briefly review a, one of my surgical videos that shows the technique through the middle fossa approach. I in fact use the old dandy incision. Uh, believe it or not, I went back about 100, 110 years and I used the curve incision by dandy and it works beautifully. I do not use the linear incision, which I know all of you guys use most likely. The reason I use this incision is that Biocutaneous flap inferiorly, it decreases the working distance to the uh, target within the CP angle. In addition, um, I've never had a CSF leak through the incision using this because just like our shunts, the incision is not directly over, over the um, craniotomy, but in fact around it. And um, um, the muscle dissection is significantly less and therefore uh, potentially it can preserve or actually minimize the risk of post-operative pain. Obviously I use the lateral position because it keeps the neck in the most physiological position. And that's important because I think, especially for patients who ha have a high BMI, putting them supine and really cranking on the neck can cause intractable post-operative headaches. So this incision has really worked well for me. I highly recommend at least trying it and if you don't like it, obviously you can always switch back to what you used to do. I do um, perform a lumbar puncture at the beginning if there's no obstructive hydrocephalus because that really relaxes the dura. The uh, craniotomy is much more efficient. The venous sinuses can be easily dissected away from the craniotomy and just the opening can be done within 15 to 20 minutes. And um, within about 20 minutes, I'm um, at the tumor because all the intracranial tension is released via the um, lumbar puncture. So it really does help and it takes only a few minutes. So uh, again, the latter position is my most favorite. Anytime I can keep the body in the most physiologic posture is my preference. The exposure is very standard. As you can see, Singer burr hole, I open the dura along the venous sinuses. Again, that's different than most people do. And the reason I do that is because I like the dura to cover the cerebellum, protect it. And most importantly, I like the dura not to be within the intense of the microscope because it shrinks the dura and it's difficult to close it. Most of the time, even after an acoustic, I can easily close the dura primarily without using graft because uh, again, the dura is protected under a talfa or a cottonoid patty 
over the cerebellum. So this is a nice way to open the dura and uh, protect it against the light on the microscope. So you can see the cerebellar retractor that is holding the myocutaneous flap, and you can see this really very minimal depth, increase in depth by the muscles in the myocutaneous flap is reflected inferiorly. These standards um, techniques, obviously we all know, using the uh, stimulator, uh, there is very efficient ways to remove the cerebellum. One of the things that I have uh, come to like, which again, it sounds a little bit sort of um, maybe archaic, but it really works well, is if the tumor is more than three centimeters, I resect very small amount of lateral cerebellum. Just maybe, you know, half a centimeter of the width, it has never caused any undue untoward side effects in my patient, and it really exposes the tumor so nicely. The moment that cerebellum moves out of way, the tumor completely looking at you, that improves the efficiency of the procedure for me significantly, rather than fighting with the cerebellum at all times. In fact, um, if you don't fight the cerebellum because you move the small lateral ribbon of it, you're you know, I don't use retractors and most of the time. In addition, you are not pushing on the cerebellum to cause venous congestion. And also you're not pushing on the cerebellum to tear the tentorial bridging veins, which often can tear, can lead to a lot of annoying bleeding. And so removing that just tiny ribbon of cerebellum has been a huge um, pearl for me to be able to get that tumor so obviously clarif um, in front of me. The number one rule is expose the tumor very widely, and that allows you to debulk the tumor so extremely aggressively. And the moment you do that, dissection of the capsule is a breeze. Those three pearls have really decreased the operative time for me from eight hours for a giant tumor to literally two and a half hours because I feel so much in control of the tumor and the exposure is so magnificent that I can debulk it so aggressively that I'm most of the time just dealing with a thin capsule. And it's all sort of using those two-handed dissection that Majid Sami talks about. You hold the capsule, you use the fine forceps and drag the arachnoid and pull the uh, pull the brain stem pia and the cranial nerves away from the capsule. And all of that is only possible if your capsule is very, very thin. So uh, I use that dissection technique, as I showed before, of getting the arachnoid and just moving the nerves away. I never touch the nerves. That's the new rule one for a sitting position that's so advantageous. That's because of the fact that the sitting position lets the fluid and the blood run away. You don't spend time by pollering, injuring, and you can use the bimanual dissection technique. Again, tumor forceps and fine forceps to be able to dissect the structures very efficiently. And uh, uh, we are coming up shortly with uh, a set of um, cotinoids, just to give you guys um, some sort of news about these new cotinoids that I have created um, um, that have a suction within them and you can actually leave the suction within the uh, cotinoid within the operative field and they, uh, they are used as like a suction for you and it makes such a big difference because it's like doing the patient in a supine or a lateral position but the use of the cotton pad is to can, um, can uh, make you like having the patient in a sitting position. So um, the section in the left lower corner of the cranial nerves, this is a right-sided tumor. And on, on the right, you can see the fifth cranial nerve being dissected. And then the aspect of tumor dissection, again, rolling the tumor laterally from medial to lateral and be able to find the seventh cranial nerve is generous exposure via slight ribbon dissection, uh, removal of the cerebellum, along tumor because I have so control over the majority of the bulk and the girth of the tumor. Um, the third um, advantage is I find the facial nerve very early on. I follow the ninth nerve, and when you find the ninth nerve joining brainstem, 
that is where the seventh cranial nerve exit zone is. It's always constant. That is the fastest way for anyone to find a facial nerve. The moment you find a facial nerve zone, you're so extremely easy because now you can estimate the route and you can be much more aggressive rather than stopping at every centimeter of the tumor and get a stimulator and, uh, and the confidence of early control of the facial nerve is so paramount in removal in this tumor. As you can see, the seventh and eighth cranial nerve identifier. I move circumferentially and just deliver the tumor into our resection cavity because the um, the uh, capsule is so thin. And then after that, really, it's just using the tumor forceps, bipolar, uh, uh, bipolar forceps, and um, just dissecting the tumor away from the capsule of the tumor and delivering the tumor. This, um, I've done over about 300 uh, 20 acoustics now, and this has been a variation of the facial nerve that's seen giant tumors. I've seen some terrible ones like the right lower corner where the seventh nerve comes posterior and then goes here. Typically, most of them can stay along the anterior belly of the tumor and just fairly move superiorly. Obviously, if that's the case, it's excellent, but if you're dealing with a tumor, such as um, a nerve such as the right lower corner, it is gonna be extremely long day and facial nerve function would be for sure compromised. So what are my personal reflections? Patient selection is critical. One has to have an open mind about radio surgery and surgery combined. I do both, that's why I don't necessarily have to send a patient to a radio surgeon. And as a surgeon, we should offer endoscopic, open radio surgery all combined together, because in that case, it's the pathology that, that determines the uh, best approach rather than a surgeon's expertise determining what is the best approach for the patient. Um, as I've always said, I review my surgical videos very, very meticulously and religiously. That has been the, um, um, the product has been the neurosurgical atlas. So immense in causing very aesthetic, choreographically well planned surgical movements. And you can always, always do better in every surgery compared to the last one. I look at the surgery like playing a piano and there's no way to um, sort of practice your performance for your final uh, performance. Uh, you do your practice um, in the lab, you do practice early on in your career, watching your videos, listening to your colleagues, and then you do compete and you search short, you make your research, and you turn your surgery into bad. It's not a bad it's a bad you'll know um, LA versus your breakdance easily. Bala reaction, it really can lead to terrible results. Debug the tumor aggressively, find the seventh nerve early, handle the nerve extremely gently, I extremely rarely even as possible, obviously. Talk still the audio doing okay. Do I have two more minutes or am I running out of time? How about how about one minute, Aaron? Actually, we're starting to lose your audio. The la just the last minute or so, it's been choppy. This is a nice video. Okay, um, do me a favor. I'm just gonna show some pieces of this. Can you still hear me? Okay, uh, Jacques. Yeah, now I now I can. Yes. Okay, I'm going to let the video run. Yes, portions, yeah, that'd be great. Describing the technical pearl penis masked with air cells. Can you hear the audio? Minus, obviously, this is the rest of the approach. Um, no, 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 the audio, the audio of the video is, yes, not, yeah. is not very good. We yeah. can hear you better. Okay, so you can see here going along the cerebellum, we'll the dissection you can see of okay. the uh, nerve very easily there. Um, 
and uh, we go uh, obviously use the stimulator to be able to see the posterior capsule of the tumor, opening the arachnoid bands, um, and then um, stimulating again the posterior capsule just to be able to roll out those very unusual cases. This is the small amount of cerebellar capsule removal, that part of its uh, cerebellum that's very thin, it's just the cap of cerebellum over the tumor, removing that a little bit early on leads to exposure of the tumor. And then after that, the lower cranial nerves are dissected. The tumor capsule is very easily um, um, coagulated. Again, this is very aggressive debulking of the tumor that you can appreciate. After the capsule is very our cranial nerves are protected. We move uh, again using that dissection technique I talked about using the bipolar forceps. This is the fifth nerve being dissected from um, the lower pole of the tumor. Again, grabbing the arachnoid and peel membranes and just moving the nerve away or the brain stem. That's the root entity zone of the um, of the uh, fifth nerve. You see it's very efficient. It's relatively a traumatic and really moves things forward using Marisol patties that are very non-stick to protect the nerves. And then as you can see, you can deliver the capsule from medial to lateral. It's very thinned out. It's very efficient to get big bulk of the tumor into your resection cavity. And this is absolutely a critical part of the operation to get this tumor out effectively. And again, the same methodology is going forward, finding the seventh nerve here, you can see at the brainstem covered by vessels. I'm not gonna go through that. Debulking the tumor further, finding into the IAC and be able to move on both sides within the IC, as you can see here with this flat knife and then using sharp dissector. Again, that's the nerve right here at the tip of the arrow. All of those techniques are, again, we don't touch the nerve whatsoever. You dissect the tumor away from the nerve rather than vice versa. So with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end and thank you for being patient with me, um, Jacques and my technical difficulties. Thanks, Aaron. Very, very good. Absolutely very good pearls that uh, hopefully the young and maybe not so young in the audience will, uh, will think about in their surgeries on the acoustic neuromas. Indeed, it's, as I tell my residents, actually, it's probably the one operation that I kept learning how to do several years into be after becoming an attending, more than any other surgery. Those little nuances are very hard to explain and you have to kind of live through the mistakes of making mistakes and then learning from your own mistakes. So you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and last but not least, of course, uh, Bill, talk to us about, I guess you titled it craniocervical surgery. Okay, all yours. Thank you, Jacques. It's really an honor to be here and I really appreciate it. And I thank you all the people that organized this and the previous speakers, which were so informative. Um, I'd like to talk about an area of, of surgery that um, I think is really a challenge for a lot of people. I notice when the fellows and the, the residents, this is an area that they're least experienced with because I think it's something that we do much less frequently than standard cranial approaches. And um, uh, I'd like to talk about the far lateral and the extreme lateral transodontoid approach. And the name of the game here is really to get to pathology at the anterior frame and magnum in front of the brain stem, in front of the spinal cord, and the old maxim of removing brain or bone to avoid uh, brain retraction. And so uh, you'll have to decide how much uh, exposure that you'll need. And I'll talk about how much uh, condyle we remove in general. Um, but again, the tumor can create um, your window, as was mentioned several times by the previous speakers. And so we'll tailor um, 
I think Yuha used the term far enough laterally, which I think is a great um, a way to describe it. So you you tailor the approach to the to what you're trying to achieve. And uh, for pica aneurysms, usually not much condyle, but for some of the tumors, we'll take off more condyle. This is a, a modification of Fukushima's lateral position. And, and I just note that we pull the arm down so it widens up this uh, angle here and then laterally uh, flex the neck a little bit. And then we'll go ahead and uh, choose an approach, a far lateral approach and an incision tailored to what we need to do. So I'm gonna show you uh, the little targeted approach that I use and the technique that I use. And um, it's a little more challenging than using the big flap, which a lot of people do routinely. And we use the big flap and I'll show you when. Um, but basically the key to the operation in, in the way I do it is to identify the transverse process of C1. And it's where this um, triangle of muscles, this deep triangle of muscles lies. And the idea is that you have three layers of muscles in the neck. You have your superficial layer, your middle layer, and then the suboccipital triangle, which identifies the vertebral artery for you, okay? And the lateral aspect of the triangle is on the transverse process of C1. And <clears throat> to find the transverse process of C1, you can feel it on your own head if you're thin. You can feel the tip of the mastoid, and one centimeter below that, you'll feel the prominence or the transverse process of C1. And here it's uh, diagrammed in this cartoon, but the uh, superior oblique and the inferior oblique attach to the transverse process of C1. So you make your incision, you dissect through the superficial layers of muscles, the middle layer, and then you identify the transverse process. And that then is your guide to the vertebral artery in the J groove. Um, so you, you disconnect the muscle from the T piece posteriorly or medially. So you bring the muscle back and that gives you more lateral exposure. And then of course you identify the vertebral artery. Um, this is the opening that I use. Um, usually just uh, along the lateral aspect of the sigmoid sinus, we do a retro sigmoid opening as well. Uh, and then drill variable amounts of the condyle as I'll describe. And then open up the dura just behind uh, where the vertebral enter artery enters the dura. This then gives you a good visualization of the extradural and intradural vertebral artery. And then um, you then drill the condyle uh, as much as you need. And when we drill the condyle, we drill the medial part of the condyle much more than laterally, because the name of the game is to get the bone, the bone off next to the dura, because that's what's actually limiting your view. The lateral part of the condyle is not limiting your view, it's the medial part of the condyle. And if you want to, you can go ahead and find the hypoglossal nerve, and I'll show you where that is. But we look at the CT scan beforehand and try to identify where the hypoglossal canal is and the distance from the joint, the occipital C1 joint, and you can measure up how many millimeters, because it is variable in the vertical dimension, and we published on that. And then roughly the joint approximates the angle of the of the hypoglossal canal. So the young people always are struggling trying to find the hypoglossal nerve. It can often be covered by a venous plexus as well, but it roughly approximates the angle of the joint. So if you find the angle of the joint, then you can find the hypoglossal canal, which mirrors that. We'll remove the lateral aspect of C1, and then um, go ahead and then remove as much condyle as you need. This is just a little technique that I use to uh, prevent pseudomeningocele formation and also um, the CSF leak through the wound. And this is just something that um, I modified from Fukushima's original uh, uh, description of this, um, but we'll use FAT just like we used to close uh, endonasal approaches with. And this is a, a, I'll show you the technical aspects of the operation using this case. So here's a woman with a large frame and magnum meningioma. She's going quadriparatic. And you can see it's a little bit biased to the right. And so we'll use a right far lateral approach. Uh, so we put the patient in the lateral position. And then we'll prep her leg out for fat and fascia if we wish. And here's this targeted incision that I'll use. And the epicenter of the incision is usually just over the transverse process of C1. 
So here we've done the deep dissection of the muscles. We'll do a suboccipital uh, craniectomy and then drill out um, the region next to the, uh, to the condyle. You have to spend some time uh, clearing up all the soft tissue over the condyle. Remember the vertebral artery shows you where your condyle is. It comes around the condyle. And then we'll remove um, the lateral uh, uh, lamina of C1 and expose the V2 nerve root or the, the cervical nerve root of C2 here. C1 runs adjacent to the vertebral artery. Then we'll open up the dura just behind the vertebral artery. Now, what you can see here is the, I'm gonna show you, this is the uh, a spinal accessory nerve, obviously. Here's the dentate at C12. You can open that for extra room. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the arachnoid over the tumor. This, this operation puts you right on the tumor and debulk the tumor. Because what we wanna really be careful with is the, is the posterior aspect of the tumor and its interface with the brain stem and the spinal cord. And I'm always paranoid about uh, interfering with the anterior spinal artery in these cases. And so I'll show you a few tricks that I use to try and avoid injury to that. So we'll expose the arachnoid. We'll loosen up the spinal accessory nerve. You can put some lidocaine on that nerve. It, it dulls it down so it doesn't, um, the patient doesn't jump if you accidentally bump it. And this is quite a vascular tumor. So we'll go ahead and um, remove the center of the tumor with an ultrasonic aspirator. And really debulk it well, because you don't want to um, move the brainstem or the spinal cord at all. Now, what you're gonna see here, uh, you'll just see one aspect of once we start dissecting the capsule, I'll identify the anterior spinal artery, which is sometimes very difficult to see, but you can see it right there. Okay, so we're going to be really careful about manipulation of that. Okay, and so here we'll remove the capsule and then ultimately remove it right down to its attachment on the frame and magnum. And then, and then we take time and cauterize and remove the, the attachment completely and cauterize the attachment uh, on the dura. And at this point, I'll be using, uh, we'll ask the anesthesia to use hypertension to keep the blood pressure up, keep her well hydrated, and we'll use papaverin in the field to open up those blood vessels. Now, it's often hard to close the dura in this area, so we'll bolster this with a fascia graft or alloderm, and then we use fat. And the idea here is to pack the fat in the area, and then when you close the muscles, you put tension on the fat and it bolsters the eye at the area and it closes the dead space to avoid pseudomagnesial. And so that's the operation that I usually do if I can, a targeted operation. You can see fat graft and this patient uh, did well. So we looked at 51 cases that I'd use this little incision on and we had CSF at leak in one patient through the incision, we treated with a lumbar drain and uh, we had no pseudomagnesial. So just a little trick to avoid that. So what are the variants of the suboccipital uh, uh, and far lateral approach? Uh, you can use a suboccipital flap, which I'll show you, or lateral incision, as I showed you there. And then the drilling of the condyle and the tubercle is tailored to the pathology to be addressed. We can transpose the vertebral, which I'll show you in a case coming up. And if you're going to do a pica to pica bypass uh, for, say, an aneurysm of the proximal pica, then you're going to have to ex expose more uh, posteriorly and identify the tonsillar loops of the pica. And then you can combine this operation with a transtemporal approach. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to show some work that uh, I really want to credit uh, Andrew Daly and Marcus Mazur because we shared a number of cases over the years. This is a terrible glomus tumor. You can see this is one of the worst glomus tumors that I've seen. And after we resected it, uh, we resected all the bone. We didn't resect the condyle itself, but we resected all the bone above the condyle, you see. And needless to say, six weeks postoperatively, she became unstable. So even if you don't attack the joint itself, if you destabilize it and disconnect the joint, you can get instability. 
And so you can see what she looked like six weeks later. She was fine neurologically, but she had a tilted head and was had neck pain. And so she underwent a, a OC fusion by Andrew Daly. And so if you resect the condyle beyond the, the hypoglossal canal, usually, uh, you'll also get instability. And I'll talk about uh, the studies that they've done to demonstrate this. So historically, if the tumors go beyond uh, the hypoglossal canal, uh, we'll consider, uh, or we resect the, the condyle beyond the hypoglossal canal, we'll consider a fusion, either shortly, up, either up front or, or post-operatively. And these are a number of papers that we published on this, but we looked at my own series where I had actually drilled significant amounts of the condyle. And we had 66 cases. And if you look here, if we resected posterior to the, the hypoglossal canal, we had no instability in almost all of them. And the only one we had instability on uh, was when we had a tumor invading the dens concurrently, okay? So you're usually safe if you stay outside of the hypoglossal canal, but that's with a caveat and I'm gonna show you why. So if you resect into the hypoglossal canal, uh, we had no instability in, in five, in three of the five, and OC instability in two of the five that went on to, uh, to uh, stabilization surgery. So can the hypoglossal canal be used as a guide to extend uh, the resection and avoid instability? And uh, how much uh, condyle resection is performed during a far lateral approach? And can the development of instability be predicted? Well, this was a nice study done about 15 years ago that showed that the majority of the hypoglossal canals are somewhat in the center of the condyle. But I wanna point out that it's anterior to the midpoint in 17% of, of their series, okay? So it's not always predictable. So we'll look at the scan and try to determine how far anterior in the condyle the hypoglossal canal is, if we're gonna use that as a landmark, okay? And then, so we went then and looked at this whole destabilization business and we had access to our um, biomechanical lab with our orthopedic department and we did cadaver dissections. And uh, Marcus Mazur drilled out the condyle at variable amounts and determined instability based on the amount of condyle that's been removed. And so he had nine specimens and he progressively drilled uh, different amounts of condyle in these different heads. And what you find is that the amount of condyle resected continues to destabilize the neck and once you get beyond about 40%, there's quite significant destabilization. And then they did stiffness and axial rotation studies as well, and lateral bending. But what he felt was the optimal cutoff was about a third of the condyle that you can take off fairly safely and be assured that you haven't destabilized the neck. And I think that's the take home message here from these studies. And then they went on and did a number of studies based on the strength of restabilization. And um, Andrew Daly was the senior author on this. But basically what they found is that the bilateral OCC2 construct was the strongest, but unilateral may be appropriate, especially if you don't have enough bone to get into uh, bilaterally. And it's usually uh, uh, does fine. So the conclusions of this work were that um, three of our 66 patients had an instability and went on to uh, fusion surgery. Deformity develops over several weeks or months. It doesn't occur, uh, occur immediately, so you can watch it. No reported deaths or complications and may delay surgery until symptoms arise. So if we drill more than a third of the condyle, we'll watch them very carefully with serial imaging over the first few weeks and months after surgery. And then the intraoperative CT is more accurate and a bilateral construct is the best if you can do it. So <clears throat> finally, I just wanna talk a little bit about the extreme lateral transodontoid approach. And I think this uh, is a little bit controversial, but I, I wanna show you where our thinking was um, in developing this approach and idea. So here's a case, and this was a published case. This was a, 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 a terrible case of a chordoma in a child that I did some years ago. And uh, some of these chordomas rarely can be very, very fibrous. 
And um, and so when I when I saw this, I knee jerk said, well, let's do a transnasal approach. You can see C2, C1's involved. Um, she's got a lot of mass in the midline. And I thought this should be fine. We'll just go ahead transnasally as a chordoma, it's usually soft. But the tumor was incredibly fibrous and I couldn't mobilize it. I couldn't mobilize it. It was literally had to cut it out. And so we ended up doing a far lateral on one side to get the rest of the tumor. And then I knocked her vocal cord out on that side. So we waited six months for the vocal cord to improve and then had to do a far lateral on the other side to finally get the tumor out. And I said, well, gosh, if we were gonna do that, then you know, really, we really didn't add anything with the transnasal. And could we use a, a far lateral approach to more effectiveness to be able to remove the tumor completely. So that was the whole genesis of the idea. So the name of the game is, is that if you're going to be coming anteriorly to remove a large tumor, and you know that you're going to be destabilizing the spine, if you're involving the C12 joint, for instance, and you're going to have to remove the odontoid, then we'll just go ahead and do a giant far lateral approach and reach cross court and get the tumor on the far side. And so once you remove the bone, then you're able to go ahead and see the tumor on the, co on the contralateral side. We did a number of cadaver studies, uh, but the idea is that you remove the bone necessary to be able to achieve what you need to do. And I'll just demonstrate it on, uh, on this very dramatic case of a young girl uh, with a giant chordoma, one of the worst ones that I've ever seen. Um, she had three months of nasal obstruction, dysphagia, and uh, weight loss. And her imaging showed all this bony destruction of uh, the clivus and this giant uh, chordoma uh, <clears throat> that we thought may have gone intradurally as well. So 10 years ago, I probably would have done a trans uh, oral or transnasal on this initially, but we'll use the extreme lateral transodontoid approach in this case. Now we'll use the giant uh, hockey stick flap in this case, because we're going to need to go midline to be able to fuse the patient at the end of the surgery. So it's a simple matter. You just make the big flap right at the superior nuchal line, and then you expose uh, uh, the vertebral artery running in the J groove uh, of C1. And so we'll go ahead and remove the bone of the, uh, of the, of C1, the lamina of C1. And we're going to move the vertebral artery out of the way this, in this case. So we'll transpose the vertebral artery from C1 and you can, we've done this on cases, I've transposed the vertebral artery down to C5 in some cases in the neck, and it's fine. You just mobilize it and then you put it back gently and tether it when you get uh, at the end of the case. But once you've transposed the vertebral artery, then this gives you a beautiful window to look anteriorly. So we'll go ahead and gently put a vessel loop on the um, vertebral artery. Here's the lateral mass of C1 and the condyle here. And then since we know we're going to end up destabilizing this patient with removing the tumor, we'll just remove the bone that's necessary to be removed to remove the tumor properly. The beauty of this is that you're coming behind the nasopharynx and the oropharynx and you're not um, exposing it all to the um, uh, contaminated cavity. So we'll go ahead and remove the ipsilateral tumor. And then you'll see us remove the odontoid and then we'll remove the contralateral tumor. The hypoglossal nerve you have to pay attention to and we've drilled it out from the canal. We'll remove the odontoid. We use image guidance, usually a CT image guidance for this operation. And then I like to, once we remove the tumor, I like to drill the bone in a supramaximal fashion to drill into normal bone to make sure we've got good margins around the tumor. So we'll remove the tumor on the contralateral side and you're able to usually see the carotid artery on this. And in some cases I've seen the vertebral on the other side as well. And then remove all the tumor from the soft tissue.
Now this tumor we felt was going through the dura. We were worried about that. So we're going to dissect the tumor off the dura. And then you'll see me open the dura and make sure that there's no tumor left intradurally. You can see the spinal accessory nerve and there's tumor just going through the dura right there. So we'll remove this area and the dura involved as well. Vertebral artery and its branches. And then we'll go ahead and drill extra bone, as I mentioned, to try and uh, achieve a super maximal resection and a complete resection of all the bony involvement. We can drill the clivus, and you can drill this up as far as you need to, because you can extend this into a, a retrosigmoid if you so wish, and remove more of the clivus. And then we'll gently skeletonize the hypoglossal nerve right out to the uh, face here. And then we'll go ahead and uh, after a tumor is removed, we'll close. And um, she was very thin, so we'll put some we'll put some fat in here. She didn't have much fat to donate. And um, and then we'll remove and put the vertebral artery back in its native position, and then go ahead and close. And then you can see, I think um, we didn't, uh, this took most of the day, this case, so we didn't do a fusion uh, at this time, but she was brought back a few days later and uh, Andrew Daly did a occipital cervical fusion. And you can see her post-op scan. And so on post day five, he went ahead and did the fusion. So in conclusion, I think this approach provides an alternative to ventrally based approaches uh, when the likelihood of removing these tumors in one stage is low. So this got, gives you the option of, of doing a one stage fusion and tumor removal um, if you uh, deem it necessary up front. And finally, I'd like to leave you, Jacques and the group with this case. Um, and I will tell you, I'm scratching my head. I just don't know what I'm, we're going to do with this. This is a case of Doug Brockmeyers. It's a child with osteogenesis imperfection, imperfecta and basal invagination. One of the most dramatic cases that I've seen, you can see her petrous bones are pointed upwards. And um, this is her uh, brainstem. The clivus is pointing upwards. And uh, the question is, what would you do? She's already been fused, and then she continued to settle, I presume, because of her osteogenesis. So we're contemplating what we're going to do with this child, but um, I'd appreciate your thoughts. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill, very much for this tour of the CVJ. Um, well, that last case, you know, it Sorry, Jacques, hurt. I think you're muted. No. C can you hear me, guys? Okay, sorry. You can hear it, yeah. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Alan Crocker had quite a series of osteogenesis imperfecta when I was his registrar many years ago. Um, that's a tough case. I'm not quite sure, uh, you know, the, the, the angle that you're showing is so hard to go transorally or endonasally, but... Uh, well, maybe we'll open it up to, for the audience. Um, but okay, so before we tackle the questions of the audience, I'll invite uh, my fellow Nick Khan to show one case for the group and get us engaged into one case. And maybe after that, uh, Carolina, perhaps you could uh, handle the audience questions and uh, get everybody discussing things together. Uh, Nick, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Marcos, can you see my slides and hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, Nicholas Kahn. I'm the fellow working in the cerebrovascular skull base at Miami this year and um, wonderful talks. I know I learned something from each of the talks today. I would like to show a case to the panel of experts to see how they would manage it. Um, 
there's different ways. I chose this one because there's many different ways that uh, one could approach it. And we'll just start um, with the case. So uh, this is a 60 year old man uh, who's otherwise healthy. He presented to us with dizziness, ataxia and memory loss. He has no other relevant past medical or physical exam findings. He does have uh, functional hearing on the left, which will be important to, uh, to note. He had a word recognition score of 100%. Here's his uh, present, uh, presenting CT. Uh, we can see a hyperdense mass located uh, in the petroclival region. And we'll go through just a little bit more detailed videos. Um, this is an axial T1 with a contrast. We'll just let it play slowly. You can see the relationship between the basilar artery and the carotid anteriorly and extending down just above the IAC with the PCA draped on top of the tumor there and a coronal. He does have a VP shunt in place. You can see from the, the artifact there. We'll go to a sagittal. And lastly, a T2, just to better understand the vasculature. So in summary, uh, this is a 60 year old, otherwise healthy male uh, who has gait imbalance, dizziness and ataxia, and he has a four by four centimeter contrast enhancing dural base lesion uh, in the petroclival region causing hydrocephalus. And before we go into anything further, I'd like you to stop there um, and see how the panel of experts will manage this. We'll go back to a few of the pictures if necessary. Well, let, let's do it in the order of the speakers, Paul. What tell us your wisdom on this case? Yeah, it's a very tough case. Um, I think uh, I would do a combination of approaches. I think uh, probably a combination of uh, operatozygomatic um, and and uh, transpetrosal, uh, antitranspetrosal combined with endonasal, because I think there are components that are too low and too medial to access well through an antitranspetrosal. Uh, pretemporal approach uh, or subtemporal. And I think that there are uh, aspects that are, of course, far too lateral and extend <clears throat> too superiorly um, to access through a purely endonasal approach. So I would do a combination approach. Uh, because the patient's presenting largely with ataxia and brainstem compression, I would probably do the endonasal portion first because that decompresses and accesses the brainstem the best, uh, and then do the lateral approach second. Um, uh, so that's how I would probably approach this, I think. Uh, Paul, is there any role for embolization at, uh, at your institution for these meningiomas? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the major branches of this come off the internal carotid. And I think even in the cases where you do get a good embolization, if the tumor is large enough for it to be helpful to you, uh, they generally would swell right after embolization. So you either do it first thing in the morning and then start your uh, huge surgery late or uh, you don't do it because if you do it over in the uh, overnight or try to wait a day, I find that they swell and that can be a real problem. I agree with you. I, I have no, no use for embolization for most skull base meningiomas. Juan, uh, do, do you agree with that approach? Do you have a different opinion? I, I, I think I would do this uh, through a um, extended middle force approach, starting with a, you know, Extra approach, approach, anterior clinodectomy, you know, the wall of the cavernous sinus, the temporal lobe dura of the cavernous sinus, petrous apex drilling. Um, always the question is whether to add a bit of posterior petrosectomy or not to get most po more posterior on the carrying the tent. But since I have to take the clinoid, I think that would be a bit more difficult. But so I would probably do anterior petrosectomy for the most part. Uh, Juan, if I, uh, Nick, can you show him maybe a coronal? Uh, Paul didn't want to do it because he felt it was quite low. Tell us how, when you think of a, uh, whatever, Kawazi extended, do you, what, do you have a lower limit? Is it seven and yeah. eighth nerve or what? Yeah, IIC, the IIC. I, I, is it, does it go lower than the IIC? If it does go lower than the IIC, then I will have to do a posterior petrosectomy with it. Uh, Nick, show him maybe the sagittal. Looks like yeah. it goes down or, to the jugular tubercle, and and also that you know there's a, uh, I guess one that what about the component that's 
an, you know, anterior medial against the against the clivus. Some of that you're sort of blocked out by uh, uh, both the, tri the gasserian ganglion and the sixth nerve to some degree. There's a chunk. Yeah, I, with this view, I think I would do combined transpetrosal. Combined with, with posterior, you mean? Mm -hmm. Posterior, posterior and anterior. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so you think so? You find no reason to combine with endonasal. Um. I think you can do it, and um, but uh, oh, I know you can do it. But I mean, the question is, you know, that you know, we have a young audience who I want to kind of, you know, they're going to hear different, and many of us giving different opinions. I think it's very important for them to understand, not necessarily for us to agree, but to the rationale behind each of our choices. Uh, that, I, that's what I want to make sure that they get out of the the, the, the whole session in general. So I for, personally. For, for, Go ahead. Sorry. I personally would do transpetrosal for this. Okay. You know, I've, I've come to like the approach. I work with Jack Lord here at Stanford. He's a phenomenal ENT partner. We, we can do the approach quickly um, and we can do it in one single day. And I, I think it's what I would do. I think endonasal is perfectly valuable to do. You can do one stage endonasal, decompress the retrochasmatic, retroinfundibular, transclival approach, and then come later and do a lateral approach for that. That's another option. Okay. But not the one I would do. Aaron, do you still have audio? Are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. So what? So, uh, tell us what you do. You know, I have done a number of these, in fact, of these petroclavo meningiomas with more um, sort of extension into the basal cisterns and supratentural space. I would do this through a terional trans uh, cavernous approach, cutting the tentorium, Getting um, um, uh, sometimes I go the, um, um, do that again the transcavernous approach that Chris talks about. Yeah, you can actually drill the bone, so um, the petrous bone in that window as well, and further expand your corridor. And if there is any residual tumor left, I would come back through a. Um, la retrosigmoid and supracerebellar and cut the tentorium further and remove the residual tumor. It works beautifully. It's much more efficient. You're spending most of your efforts handling the target rather than how to get there. And uh, the morbidity is significantly less. Okay. Uh, Bill. You're muted, Bill. Bill. Thanks. Yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you, Jock. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I got the sun in my eyes. So, but th this looks like a sphenopetroclival meningioma. And um, what I would do in this case is I would do a uh, combined petrosal anterior and posterior petrosal. And, and the, the reason is the following is that um, I don't like the anterior petrosal only for meningiomas for the reason that actually Paul brought up um, in that, the, the attachment of the meningioma is broad and the petrosal approach, it, you, it, you're able to remove, if you use the anterior petrosal approach, you're able to remove the attachment for the exact uh, you know, area where you open the petrous bone, but you can't go along the parallel aspect of the posterior petrous bone and cauterize all the attachment properly. And it's easier to see the sixth nerve um, if you come posterior petrosal. And so I, I would do, a combined petrosal, but I, I have abandoned doing the big L-shaped bone flap. And if we don't need to take the mastoid down, I'll do a, a, a large incision that goes behind the ear, but we'll do a, a middle fossa approach and a retrosigmoid approach and use it through two approaches through one skin incision to avoid complications of trying to um, take the, uh, the, the bone off, away from the sinuses, especially in older women. Uh, do me a favor, Bill. I have a question. Uh, um, Jacques, would you mind putting up the coronal again? Yeah. Uh, you know, Bill, I, I agree most people would uh, vote for that. What are your thoughts about, I mean, this would require a fair amount of temporal lobe retraction on the dominant side. With yeah, no, but what, what, what we do is we do frontotemporal. So you I come see. down frontotemporal through that incision and then retrosigmoid. So, so you do the, the middle fossa through a frontotemporal area. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, if you're middle fossa, you're still subtemporal or you're similar to what I say, you do a terional. Yeah, and split it's a terional. 
For, for the upper part of that, it's terional for sure. Okay, so it's the same approach that I discussed. It's an extended terional with a, a posterior fossa retrosigma. Correct. Correct. So your approach and my approach are similar, essentially. Yeah, so sounds like it. Okay, just for the sake of time, uh, Nick, tell us, so the audience has heard different ways of tackling those tough lesions. Nick, uh, show them what we did. Sure, um, and these are kind of the, you know, the different options that we were thinking of at the time, uh, whether an endonasal endoscopic uh, or a transpetrous or a transylvian half and half approach or a retrosigmoid or a combination of any of the above. So uh, we covered most of those. What we chose was a combined petrosal with a partial, since he had functional hearing, we did a partial uh, labyrinthectomy with a superior and posterior semicircular canals combined with a anterior petrosal approach. And we'll have a little bit of the upper video that we'll share here. Uh, in the top left, uh, you see the skin incision that we used, which was the C shape. Uh, here in the um, video, I'll pause here for a second. Uh, the mastoidectomy and partial labyrinthectomy has already been done uh, superiorly as a temporal lobe, anteriorly is anteriorly, obviously. Right in front of the labyrinth is the muscle covering the ear. Uh, at this point, the uh, tentorium's already been divided. You can see the sonopet that's on the tumor there. We'll just start the video again. We'll fast forward a little bit through this. Um, so this is a view where you can see uh, Meckel's cave V3 and trigeminal nerve coming out of the brainstem as well as the posterior fossa dura from the anterior petrosectomy. <coughs> and again, generously debulking the tumor um, using the arachnoid as handles. Uh, we identified the PCA here, uh, which gave us a good idea of the depth of the tumor. I'll fast forward for time. And using these bypass forceps is nice to kind of define the tumor arachnoid plane. We eventually identified the PCOM connecting to the PCA um, and the ICA, which was a nice landmark to kind of trace and divide the tumor in half. This is a large piece of the posterior component of the tumor. Now we really have the anterior component and the superior component that are, that are remaining. We'll fast forward through a little bit of this. Developing the tumor arachnoid interface plane with a bypass forceps. Here, and this is the supraclinoidal ICA and the anterior choroidal artery. Uh, we know where the PCOM is posteriorly, and we're going to start dividing the tumor in two, basically, to come down to where the PCOM is and remove this segment, uh, which will help kind of clarify the picture. The third nerve was actually quite splayed on the outside of the tumor, and that took quite a bit of time to dissect off of it. This is removing this component of the tumor. And sonopetting debulking again. You can see the tentorium, the ICA, and the tumor extending to the cavernous sinus. This is further dissection. There, there was that third nerve very splayed. That's okay. Right. Uh, don't, don't, don't go back. It's okay. Nick, you can fast forward through yeah. it. Yeah. You know, one of the things I, um, when I do this approach, I actually like to have a bit more anterior exposure. Um, maybe it's because I feel more comfortable that way, meaning peeling the wall of the cavernous sinus. So, so I feel that the temporal lobe, um, you can manipulate it better. You detach it from anterior to posterior, from posterior to anterior, and the whole temporal lobe falls away. Um, so you require a more anterior incision and more mobilization of the temporal is muscle all the way down. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I sometimes do that. I, you know, I did. You, you, I, I exactly understand what you mean. I, I, I would have done. I think that what I did was kind of, I had enough exposure to do it. No, when you're good, you can do it with a smaller exposure. Uh, I just like to have a bit more exposure. I feel better that way. Yeah, it's it's a proportional to gray hair, uh, Juan. <laughs> well, I'm getting there. But I'm 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 willing to switch positions with you any day. <laughs> uh, Nick, oh, yeah, show them yeah. the anatomy here, Nick. Yeah, so this is, uh, I'll rewind just a little bit and let it play. Um, so once this piece comes out, you can see the SCA, the PCA, uh, the tentorium, the third nerve, and ICA 
as well as the tumor going into the cavernous sinus uh, there, which shows a little bit of the anatomy uh, depicted. Then we'll just kind of fast forward to the end here. Yeah, take us yeah to the end. Yep. Uh, and this is just the the mastoid defect. We did take a fat graft, and we ended up putting a piece of titanium mesh over this at the end. Uh, here's the post-operative CT, just showing some of the bony work here. So this is the anterior putrosectomy, posterior piece tracking. We drilled retro sigmoid to allow the sigmoid sinus to fall back once the pitorium was cut. And you can see the titanium mesh uh, that was present there. And this is just the corridor that each of those um, bony uh, drilling uh, gave us. Uh, this is the pre and post-op. Uh, the T1 hyperintensity is obviously the fat graft um, that's there on the uh, right-hand side of the screen and axial and sagittal. Uh, the patient uh, did well postoperatively. He did have a fourth nerve palsy and a partial third nerve palsy. Uh, the fourth nerve palsy is still present. The third nerve palsy is improving. He went for a short course of rehab, but he's otherwise discharged and doing well. So, so, you know, I thought, John, yeah, no, I just, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. You, yeah, can you just tell me about the um, interface with the brainstem? Because that's the critical aspect of this case. Yeah, it was tough on the arteries, you know, Bill. That's why, you know, I've, I've for a while now, I've been using my, I'm not going to mention the company's name, but those bypass forceps, I love them for tumor dissection. You know, the same ones I use for bypass. It's such a fine thing. Um, I, 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 the, the, it's really the best instrument for this. Just, yes, tedious, very tedious, as you can imagine. The, on the arteries, not on the pia of the, of the brain stem. On the arteries, it was tough. Yeah, I must say for the young audience, you know, this, this approach actually takes you so close to the tumor. That sweet angle between the anterior and posterior petrosal that you drilled, it takes you right to the attachment of the tumor, just below five, and it's, it gives you perfect view. Um, it's so, you're so close to the retinal fundibular space, and you don't even know. Right. So we, we, we're going to channel Sam Al Mefti in saying that, well, it's not, not quite, but makes it a convexity meningioma. I wish that was true, but it's, it's halfway there, you know. Um, okay, just uh, anything else, Nick, you want to show? Did you, no, that was it, correct? Okay. Now, Bill, you said something certain, right? You said that you are leaving the island covering the sigmoid sinus to prevent tearing the sinus. Which yeah, is if, 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 so sometimes we'll do the equivalent based on um, on the tumor, if we're not planning to drill the mastoid, um, then we'll do a, a you know a frontotemporal approach and a retrosigmoid through the same incision, effectively, and that way you avoid the risks of peeling the bone off over the transverse sigmoid junction, usually in older women. But Bill, but I what I love is that this the petrosal approach you know takes yeah. you on the tentorium so. Sure. Yeah, you know, I no, but we'll just yeah. yeah, we'll decide whether we think we need that. I agree with you because it gets you closer to the attachment of the tumor as well as the cerebellum falls back with the transverse sigmoid junction if you divide the tentorium. Absolutely, but I guess it it depends on the tumor and depends on how much you think you need. Jacques, do you ever stage these uh, combined patrols, especially for such a challenging tumor, so you're not dissecting tumor at you know eight o'clock? Yes. At Later. Yes, I, I, I used to never stage them and I used to start my part, <laughs> to be honest, 3 p.m. after the neuroautologist and various, uh, you know, colleagues would operate. In recent, well, this year, actually, I've probably staged two or three of them. It started, I used to say, ah, oh, what's this nonsense staging them? It actually works better to stage them. Absolutely. And That's I, fine. again, I encourage fine. younger fine. people. Isn't that your preference too? Yeah. 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 Do yeah. you keep them intubated overnight? Do you, what do you do with DVT prophylaxis? Do you give them a heparin overnight or you don't? Uh, yeah. Oh, I never skip heparin for any surgical case. I don't know what this hesitation is nationwide. Uh, do you, I mean, I give, I never skip a heparin dose perioperatively on anybody. I mean, post of day no one, but post of day one, but you would do it the night of surgery. Post of day zero. Mm -hmm. uh, on every single surgical case I have, again, there is no added incidence of hemorrhage. A couple of papers suggesting you can do that. Um, yeah. Uh, now, if it's a retro lab, I'm not going to stage it because retro lab is a little faster. But this was a partial trans lab. So it's like really a trans lab. It takes them longer. Do you, Jack, when you try to when you stage it, do you 
take a peek of the tumor to see if it's soft first, or you just don't open the no. dura. Don't be. I don't want to. I don't want to open the dura. It's messy. You know. Of course, like, I know. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. But, no. It tempts you too. I find it as soon as I open it, I'm tempted all of a sudden, regardless of the day. Exactly. <laughs> well, so, some of us, uh, Paul, are stronger willed than you, so it's okay. It's, it, temptation is nothing, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, listen, uh, Carolina, are you Carolina? Would you mind uh, telling us what the audience uh, and then please feel free to engage the panelists with yeah, your sure. question or the audience questions. So, so the residents all start heparin on post-op day zero. All the hemorrhages just happen on my patients. His patients do great with the post-op day zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, we have some really good questions from the audience here. So let's start with um, Juan, maybe you can, you can talk about this. Um, there's a question about how to prevent hypopituitarism due to mobilization of the pituitary gland. And um, Paul answered it a little bit, but I think it's a good question that a lot of people probably wanna hear more about. Okay, so I mean, there are several different ways of mobilizing the pituitary gland. The classic one, which is the intradural one, basically you just take the pituitary off the cella. That is the one that has the highest risk. Uh, but usually I do it only for what we call intrinsic pathology, meaning craniopharyngiomas, tumors of the stock, like some gliomas in the hypothalamus that we might do, or uh, pituitomas, think of that by themselves carry a very high risk of pituitary dysfunction. If I'm doing... Um, a different pathology, chondrosarcoma, cordoma, uh, meningiomas, I will go through the cavernous sinus. And then is what we call a trans, uh, an intradural uh, transposition. So you mobilize basically the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. So the, the pituitary, and you can do it bilaterally. And the pituitary is protected and it still has venous drainage. In those cases, they, when we publish about this, the incidence of dysfunction is minimal, really. Great, thank you. Um, Paul, I know you answered this as well um, to the, but I think uh, one of the important things is when you're doing these combined approaches, um, how do you choose your timing and um, what do you think about uh, making it more efficient or do you think for, you know, people starting out, whether this could actually add a lot of length to the surgery that would be problematic? Yeah, I think a, a little bit of it depends on the approaches that you're combining. If they're, if they're truly different approaches like an endonasal and a retro sig or an endonasal and an anterior petrosal, for example, uh, then I'll do them even months apart. You know, for meningiomas, they're, the tumor's not going anywhere. Uh, let the patient recover both, uh, you know, psychologically and physically from the surgery and then come back at a later date. Uh, but for ones like a transmaxillary plus an endonasal or a combined petrosal, uh, then I would prefer to do it uh, all in, in, in one stage, either back to back uh, from one day to the next or even uh, simultaneously, you know, in the same day, just depending on um, uh, depending on the length of that particular surgery and exposure. Thank you. Um, is Dr. Cohn Goodall here, Aaron? Are you still on, or is your audio on? I am here. I am here. Um, somebody, uh, one of the audience members was asking, "How do you manage if you have facial nerve injury during surgery?" Um, I guess I'm not sure if they're talking about transection or a complete injury, or if they're just saying if you're not getting stimulation, or perhaps you can speak to what if it's really stuck to the facial nerve, then at which point do you choose to stop and how do you sort of guide that? Because then you can, like you mentioned, go on to radio surgery. So where, what, in terms of your clinical or surgical uh, decision-making, um, how does that change and draw up for you? Yeah, good question. The goal is always um, functional preservation. So if there is a piece of tumor very adherent, we leave a piece of tumor behind. Most often you can't even see it on the post-operative MRI. And we just follow it and we'll go from there. If the nerve gets transected, we try to primarily sew it together. Most often you can, then you need the interposition graft. That's obviously is a very unexpected, um, unusual situation when you have injured the nerve. And um, however, most of the time, either the tumor is gross totally removed or we leave a piece of tumor on the nerve and follow it. And uh, obviously we never sacrifice function since the radio surgery has uh, demonstrated durable results in the presence of small I think we lost you. Uh, I finished talking. Oh, no, uh, he finished talking. Okay, sorry. Um, then, but you know, there are a lot of people who talk about the adaptive adaptive um, radio surgery. Do you go in, or is there ever a case where you go in um, 
with that goal in mind, or do you go in with a goal in mind to get a full resection and then, you know, see how things play out during surgery? Cause that, I think that's something that comes up pretty frequently about, you know, whether or not to just go in knowing you're going to do a subtotal resection and that some people find that to be problematic. Yeah. Excellent question. We don't uh, believe in that term of adaptive surgery, the way I think people are referring to. Um, uh, we are adaptive, but adaptive is a gray zone. How adaptive are you adaptive is, is the big question. If you're talking about, I'm going to go and do a glorified biopsy and core out the tumor and leave the capsule behind, which I have seen people defining as adaptive, that won't accomplish anything. That won't change the radiation dose or the margins. Um, when we talk about adaptive, we're talking about idea of going in with a chance for a growth store resection. However, if we find that the nerve is very adherent, we're talking about leaving an almost indetectable small piece of tumor on the nerve on the post-operative MRI. That's the definition of adaptive. It's not about coring out the tumor and leaving um, the same size and volume of radiation after surgery. All right, thank you. Dr. Codwell, um, which, what are your um, clear, what are your sort of definitive indications for transoral approaches to the cranial cervical junction? Yeah, so that's, um, an interesting question, and I think it's changed a lot over the years. I, I must admit, um, I, I did a transoral as a combined approach uh, a couple of weeks ago, but the tumor was a meningioma all in the face, and it was in the maxillary sinus, and it was in the nose, so we went endonasal most of the case, and then it went down in the nasopharynx, down past the soft palate, down into the throat, and so we chased it with the transoral. But, you know, most of the time, with an endoscope and uh, with mobilization, uh, we don't use the transoral much anymore unless we can't get it transnasally. And you can look at the lateral skull film and or the lateral MRI and predict whether you're gonna be able to reach it transnasally just by angling your endoscope past the hard palate, you know? And, um, and so we'll do that and then, um, if, if I think it's, a, it's an operation that's going to destabilize the neck anyways, and I can remove the tumor through far lateral and then fuse at the same time, I'll do it. We just, we talked about with the, the L2 approach. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, um, I guess um, to any of the panelists, but um, is there a lower age limit when you go endo endonasally? Um, what are sort of some special considerations in this age group or when you're dealing with a poorly pneumatized sinus at such a young age? And then also, can you speak a little bit about kissing carotids um, and what, what your thoughts are when you're, you have a case that you're thinking about going endonasally, but you see kissing carotids, does that stop you? I can, I can try to take the first one. Um, we've done a, a fair number of pediatric and generally anything under age two is really pushing it. Um, there is usually uh, enough room endonasally uh, under age two. If the nostrils themselves are small, you can of course do a sublabial incision to access the paranasal sinuses. That's certainly an option. Uh, under the age of two, a transorbital corridor may also be an option if you have a tumor where you think an anterior approach is uh, a good option. Um, uh, that's just a, a pure space and the size of the nostril consideration. Uh, um, we looked recently, uh, you know, mid-face development uh, ends usually around age seven and children under age of seven, there was not a dramatic difference uh, but from norms uh, in mid-face development doing an endonasal approach. So it does not seem to impact growth in a major way with the one exception being a significant clival tumor because the clivus itself, uh, if it's abnormal, can, can affect mid-face growth. But uh, in general, we didn't find endonasal to be a, a limitation. It is more challenging. You do need to collaborate with pediatric colleagues to understand the physiology and, and perioperative management. Um, but I do think it's possible. Um, usually applying your adult team with a pediatric team is, is, I think, the best way to do that. Carolina, one of the things that we'll do in those kids, if the, if the nares is just too small, like Paul just said, We'll do an old school sublabial approach and come in through both, you know, both nasal passages at the same time. It gives you a little bit more room. You can open up the piriform aperture a little bit 
and it gives you a little bit more room, working room. So you're not, um, you know, so you've got able, you're able to move your instruments around. And so that's a trick that we've used on the real little ones with cranios and uh, with the very rare pituitary tumor and a really young kid. You're on mute, Juan. I agree. I think that, you know, two years, perhaps, that's the, definitely the youngest I've done, as a case I showed you, very difficult kind of for yoma. In terms of the kissing carotids, um, it depends. I mean, there are diff so many variants that I would have to see the case in particular, but I've, I've seen, for example, cases where the kissing carotids, in between them, they have the pituitary and the tumor is above. So that's not a problem. You go above. There are cases where the carotids come close, but you can use tricks like, for example, you know, if you detach the carotids at the distal rings on both sides, you cut along the diaphragm, that doodle, that doodle that go from the distal ring to the diaphragm, you cut it, you're going to actually open it, you are opening the space. So that, I know people for many years talk about the short uh, intercarotid distance. I think that's not very relevant for almost anything that we do. It's never a contraindication for, for me because I can expand that opening and you go out, work above or below, et cetera. And then, and what about in cases of multiply recurrent uh, recurrences? Do you think uh, is that a contraindication for for the endoscopic approaches? Multiple recurrences of, of uh, canopheniomas or or uh, anything. Uh, the problem with multiple endonasal approaches is that is is the ability the availability of the flaps. Sure. That's okay. that's always my main concern, right? Where you have the septal flap available or not, and you are going to have to go to a lateral lateral initial wall flap. Or in some cases, as I saw, you know, some TP flap or pericardial flap, that's the problem. Reconstruction is always my main concern. Yeah, I agree completely. If it's a toss up and I have a, a, an approach that has not had either an open approach or endonasal, that's not had a prior resection through there, obviously a clean non-scarred plane is often the best way to approach a tumor. Um, so I, I think it is a consideration. And then I guess when, when you guys do have uh, the multiple recurrences where you have to, to go and do a repeat endoscopic and a nasal approach, um, what are some of your tricks in terms of uh, repair? Uh, I've gone to a lot of fascia lata, um, but I think I guess probably the pathway, depending on how anterior or posterior it is, is uh, inferior turbinate flap is a great rescue option, lateral nasal wall for lower defects or even for cellar defects. Then a pericranial flap can be used even all the way down to the clivus, although obviously the longer it gets, the less vascularized it is. Then a temporoparietal fascial flap, and then finally free flap, um, probably in that order. I think both Juan and I have learned to maybe not be so hesitant to use a free flap if you have a multi-time redo. Yeah, I mean, this speaks of the importance of when you're doing the skull with surgery at, at you know, a certain level, you need to collaborate with people. You need to have a good rhinologist that can do good lateral reservoir flap, you need to have a good uh, head and neck or plastic surgeon that can do good free flaps because you're gonna you know, encounter those situations. Great. Well, I think that's it in terms of questions. Those are really fantastic talks. It's 7.30, um, Dr. Marcos. Exactly, no, I agree. We can go on for a long time, but I, everybody has other lives to go to. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for spending two and a half hours of course, I remind everybody these are all recorded and available uh, to be seen free at any time on our websites. Uh, um, and I encourage the young people who may have missed some of the subtle details of these high power talks, go back and listen to them again and, uh, and enjoy. Uh, 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 Paul, Juan, Aaron, uh, Bill, good to see you all. Hope to see you all in person somewhere soon. Thank Please. you very much for sharing your time with us. Same. Bye. 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 Thanks, Jacques. Thanks, Carolina. Thank you, guys. Great to see you all. Thank you. Stay well.